if the market goes too far on its own, then the question will be, what more does the Fed need to do? The Fed is likely to cut next year, but every time the Fed announces cuts, the market doubles those cuts. The reality is the Fed may get us to a hotter landing, but the markets have to adjust to that, and they haven't. If the markets are rallying, that's OK with the Fed. The Fed doesn't have to push back on a rally because they don't like a rally. I do think the Fed put us fairly back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Good morning. This is a Bloomberg Surveillance from New York for Audience Worldwide. Uh, good morning. Welcome back. Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, Tom and John off until the new year. Katie Greifeld, you are the lucky one who gets to do this with me, and I'm so pleased to say uh, that you're here. Welcome. To me, honestly, growth concerns kind of creeping back in there very much as we head toward the holiday. That might explain what we're seeing in the bond market. I was just uh, fiddling around with some charts because the year-to-date chart looks a lot like the one-year chart. Uh, it's only like a week where we get to do that. Ten-year Treasury yields are pretty much flat on the year, which is amazing. Especially considering what people were looking for at the start of the year in terms of a recession and then some sort of recovery. We didn't get the recession. We got a recovery to no decline. Here's the issue. Nike comes out. They talk about job cuts. They talk about 400 to 450 million dollars of charges in order to cost cut across the board. Other companies are falling in tandem. Is this just idiosyncratic to the retail sector, or does this extend further beyond? I think if you ask uh, equity bulls right now, they would say it's idiosyncratic, and you see that at the benchmark level. But I will say, to your point, I mean, it, we keep hearing and hearing and hearing this story from the retailers. Uh, you have to think that uh, that means something when you add that all together. And China is, uh, especially for Nike, really warning about those macro concerns. That's been an issue for Nike in particular all year, and it continues to be. Well, this is the reason why it's sort of interesting that you point out that we're in the same place for the 10-year yield from the beginning of the year till now with a very bumpy and not a straight line at all when it comes to stocks, which have gained tremendously. Are we setting up for something perfect that cannot happen? Are we looking for uh, some kind of strength and disinflation that comes together with some sort of supply chain resolution that already happened? And that's why I think that today at 830, it's going to be really key, this key metric, whether it keeps coming in with that disinflationary kind of tendency the way the Fed is hoping for. This is the last day that matters. I think the year ends at 2 p.m. today. Absolutely. When the bond market closes, and it starts at 830 with those PCE numbers. And that's the reason why uh, we're looking to this. Yesterday uh, did get a bit of a boost and everyone was trying to explain why. One, people, one person pointed uh, to the data that came out in the third revision of the third quarter GDP, which just shows you how much people are really <laughs> reaching for things to sort of explain market movement, uh, pointing to the fact that inflation was revised lower to 2% from 2.3%, highlighting that we're getting back to the Fed's goal much more quickly. So people view this as a bullish thing. Is it bullish or does it sig signify a sort of Patrick Harker underlying weakness that's coming to the fore of the likes of Nike? That's the thing. I mean, uh, inflation, of course, has been falling quickly, much more quickly than the Fed originally expected. But is this a precursor to maybe growth actually faltering as well? Uh, you know, I know that the point has been made that a soft landing looks like a soft landing when it starts, uh, but it also, a hard landing also looks like a soft landing when you it know, starts. We were all talking uh, this week, and you and I have been talking about this for hours and hours a day, about how much everyone seems to be a buyer and everyone seems to be a bull. How surprised were you to see that equity funds had their biggest outflow since 2022, uh, since December 2022, and that money piled into cash when everyone's talking about deploying cash? This according to the uh, Bank of America EPFR data that came out overnight. You know, I follow ETF flows in particular a lot, and it feels like, you know, Typically, you should see flows follow performance. That hasn't necessarily been the case this year, especially if you look at uh, some of the bond funds in particular. And it feels like in equities, too. I mean, of course, you take a look at the price action overall on the benchmark level. It says one thing. And then you see that check of investor sentiment when it comes to where money is actually moving around. So uh, it seems like we got another reality check yesterday when you think about where people are actually putting their money. Yeah, $21 billion outflows uh, of outflows from equity funds. Just in terms 
terms of what we're looking for today, 8.30 a.m., we do get personal income, personal spending, and PCE uh, Accord deflator. That is the key metric that the Fed is looking at, uh, and typically to understand the forward trajectory. It is expected to decline further from 3.4%. Is it enough? Does this confirm the disinflationary kind of Goldilocks that people are celebrating, or does it start to signify uh, maybe any kind of shift in the narrative? At 10 a.m., we get new home sales as well as University of Michigan sentiment survey. Very curious to see uh, whether or not you get an uptick in the sentiment index, especially given what we saw in recent other uh, surveys that came out. And it is a holiday day. I mean, it definitely <laughs> feels like the last gasp before everyone goes on vacation. And I'm not just saying this because I'm going on vacation. <laughs> Treasury markets are closing today at 2 p.m. Uh, and it is kind of a quiet morning, a little bit of softness. But if this is another gain on the week for the S&P, that makes eight straight weeks of gains. That is the longest going back more than to 2017. It's pretty amazing. You think of all the capitulation we've seen as a result, especially from the sell side. Uh, I will say to the early Treasury market close, why can't the equity market get on board? It feels like this always happens, that the bond market closes, but the equity market is on a little bit of a different schedule. I think the bond market probably has it right. Yeah. You know, they've had enough pessimism <laughs> They for usually the do, right? And so, you know, I think everyone should just follow, uh, follow suit and just take the time off. Marvin Lowe may be uh, doing the same. Senior Global Macro Strategist at State Street joining us now. Marvin, do you have an answer to that, why the bond market tends to uh, kind of beat to its own drum versus the stock market? Well, I, I couldn't agree more with your assessment. So for sure, we should uh, we should um, start our, our celebrations a little bit early if we can. <laughs> Meanwhile, we are talking about how uh, treasuries are basically unchanged on the year with a very tumultuous path. Really? Do you think that stocks are getting the message that treasuries are sending right now? You know what? Um, you know, certainly there's reason to be optimistic um, within the risk assets. It's really just a matter of how aggressively things have moved. And, you know, really the, the counterweights between uh, looser financial conditions and, and you know, ultimately the, uh, the package that the Fed is trying to deliver with regard to inflation, with regard to growth. Um, and it does, to a certain degree, push back against it because financial conditions have loosened as aggressively as that 10-year yield has come down. And Marvin, I want to talk a little bit more about what we're seeing in the Treasury market, particularly at the long end of the curve. Of course, Lisa brought up that you maybe are starting to see some growth fears seep in. And you think about this incredible move that we've seen in 10-year yields, in particular, since about mid-October or so. Is that growth fears? Is that maybe a FOMO uh, grab when it comes to duration? How do you explain what's happening at the back end of the Treasury curve? Yeah, I mean, I mean, for sure, if you will, you know, what we talk about is the left tail risk, um, you know, the risk that there's a significant sell off, let's say, in bonds or, or in stocks, for that matter. Um, and the Fed kind of took that off the table, um, you know, once they once they signaled that they were done with the hiking cycle. We don't have to worry about the left tail from that perspective anymore. So, you know, we're really trying to figure out how much of this we want to buy. Um, I think the inconsistency is like um, to think about rate cuts that begin in three months. So, you know, within a quarter, um, the Fed is going to start to, uh, at least from a market perspective, a Fed is expected to start cutting. In my mind, that only happens if really bad things happen in the economy. Um, and I don't see that. It, it definitely is moving in the right direction. But in terms of, um, you know, jobs cracking and inflation all of a sudden collapsing, um, it's not there in the data, um, despite the fact that the Fed is hinting that there are other things that they're looking at other than the data. And I'd like to know what that is, if, if, if in fact it's true. And Marvin, to your point on the timing of rate cuts, I really like this line in uh, the notes that you sent over that the Fed cannot afford to cut and then need to hike again. Why is that? Sure. Sure. I mean, the, the, the credibility um, of the Fed has been called into question all year. I mean, they've really moved uh, with the tides as aggressively as you can. Um, the worst environment in my mind is one where they say that they're, you know, um, that they're signaling all clear, uh, mission accomplished, and they cut. And those inflation fears in the middle of the year, whether it's because base effects uh, start to um, wane and or the labor market remains stronger and therefore wages remain stronger and they need to somehow put a more tightening message out there, then they lose control of all their forward guidance, which in a lot of ways that they are losing control of uh, given how aggressively uh, this market has moved um, while they continue to push back on the move. So you think the risk, Marvin, is of inflation overheating and actually reaccelerating rather than true weakness in the economy. Is that right? 
you know, as far as everything I see, um, that is that is a concern. Um, and I think kind of this balance sheet discussion, which is starting to make its way into the foreground, uh, is part of that. Not only um, is the QT process in play, if you will, but if the QT process stops early, you know, let's say they coordinate um, the start of rate cuts with the stopping of QT with a massive balance sheet, I do think that you have re-accelerating inflation concerns just because the balance sheet is so big and just because um, all of those reserves, if you will, that are out there remain out there. How have you changed your view since the Fed pivot? Right. I mean, it seems like everybody is scrambling to reassess their baselines going into 2020, uh, 2024. How much have you actually changed yours? Yeah, I, I haven't that much. Um, I've really used kind of this balance sheet discussion to help guide me in terms of the thought process with regard to what the Fed should be doing um, versus, you know, what the data is ultimately is, is saying. Um, the Fed should be getting their um, financial balance sheet in order before really getting to the phase of cuts. Um, we've got too much liquidity in the system, and there are um, economic and inflation implications associated with an ongoing large balance sheet, which um, I don't think anyone would, uh, you know, I don't think anyone on the FOMC would have thought that they would be considered uh, considering stopping the balance sheet when it's still over seven trillion dollars. Let's talk about how the Fed talks about the balance sheet, because, of course, the consensus seems to be that, OK, if they're cutting rates just to get out of very restrictive territory, maybe get back to neutral, that QT can continue on. Uh, if, of course, they're cutting because there's a recession, then that becomes a little bit more challenging. But assuming it's the first scenario where they're cutting basically to get back to neutral, how do they explain that to the American public? And do they need to that they're continuing, of course, to run off the balance sheet in the background? Yeah, they, they, they do need to explain it. Um, it's incredibly complex if they're, on the one hand, uh, loosening financial conditions by cutting rates while continuing to theoretically tighten. Um, I, I don't I'm not in the camp that they would go down that route. I know I know Chair Powell raised that prospect that normalization could continue. Uh, uh, normalization um, on the rate side of things would allow them to potentially continue the um, uh, the QT process. I think what we've seen over the course of the last two to three quarters is a Fed that's coming to the conclusion just based on the number of, um, you know, the many that are, that say that you can do two things in opposite versus very few that think that now. Um, I, I think that uh, they're going to be linked at the hip ultimately. So Marvin, just heading into 2024, what's your highest conviction trade? Yeah, I mean, I think risk assets have, have um, moved too far. You know, if, if if I were to look at this, I would be concerned with valuations on the equity side of things. Um, I do think that we've probably seen the best from a yield perspective for at least the next couple of quarters. Um, and there's probably better um, lower yield type discussions that, that evolve outside of the U.S. You know, certainly we're seeing growth concerns uh, pop up in Europe and those cuts seem more justified than what we're what we're looking at here. Marvin Lowe of State Street, thank you so much uh, for your thank insights, you. talking about some of the weakness and the, the cuts that might be justified in Europe. They're not necessarily saying that, and certainly you're seeing Euro strength, uh, regardless of some of these expected cuts. You're also seeing Swiss strength. Hmm. Did you see that the Swiss franc rose to its strongest versus the dollar going back to 2015, with people kind of gaming out, OK, well, maybe they'll actually enjoy a stronger currency to bring down inflation domestically. What does the signal mean coming from the Swiss? Of course, we think about uh, growth fears maybe getting priced into uh, the Treasury market. When I think about uh, really rapid Swissy strength, it seems concerning when you think about the haven aspects. Especially given the fact that it's pretty much across the board, although it's not necessarily versus the euro right now. Mm -hmm. This is very much a dollar weakness story as well as people game out whether the Fed really has pivoted and is going to cut rates. Uh, we shall see. Right now in markets, a bit of softness, although unclear. Can we eke out? an eighth straight week of gains uh, on the S&P, basically unchanged, you know, down, uh, you know, what, a hair. Uh, and we're looking at Euro strength crossing the 110 mark. Again, this is really interesting to see the dollar really on the back foot heading into 2024. Ten-year yields hovering around that 3.86% level and crude just bouncing around that same level of 75 to $74 a barrel on uh, WTI. Coming up at 7 a.m., we get uh, hear from Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research. This is Bloomberg. It's very important to understand that the Houthis 
aren't attacking just one country. They're really attacking the international community. Uh, they, are, they are attacking the economic well-being and prosperity of nations around the world. So in effect, uh, they've really become bandits along the international highway that is the Red Sea. The Houthis need to stop these attacks. They need to stop them now. That was Major General uh, Pat Ryder, Department of Defense Press Secretary, addressing the Red Sea conflicts as a growing number of voices tried to get some stability there. Insurance costs are rising for some of these container ships, and we are seeing uh, a lot of uh, shipping companies adjust their routes. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom and John are both off today. I'm so pleased to say that Katie Greifeld's here alongside me. We are seeing a bit of softness to end the week, although things can change, and it's basically unchanged. What we are looking at is yields materially lower over the past two months, kind of hovering around that 3.86 percent. And crude, really interesting to see that crude has hovered around $74 to $75 on the barrel on WTI, Katie, especially given the fact we've had all these disruptions, we've had record demand, we have had uh, supply cuts from OPEC, and still we've seen that persistent uh, sort of weakness over in the crude sector. Yeah, I have to say crude is one of the uh, more interesting, more confusing stories this year. It seems to all be predicated on supply. And of course, uh, interesting, just yesterday, getting some OPEC drama with Angola leaving OPEC. I know we're going to get into that a little bit later. Excited for that one. I am too, especially given the fact that a lot of this has the backdrop of the United States production, which mm. is Mm -hmm. gangbusters, despite what the administration is deciding not to talk about. And I want to really uh, dovetail that into industrial policy uh, going into 2024. I'm so pleased to say Kim Wallace, head of Washington Policy Research at 2022 uh, 22V Research, joining us here in studio for the holiday party, for the holiday spirit, uh, for New York City. Thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate Good it. Good morning. Happy to be here. Good morning. Uh, I know that you put out a, an outlook for what to expect in 2024, and I want to start an industrial policy hinging off the latest news of U.S. Steel and some of the administration pushback to a Japanese conglomerate purchasing the largest steelmaker in the country. Well, you know, there's a lot of analysis that will go into the ultimate reaction from the administration. Obviously, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. will investigate the proposed merger. But when you break it down, the promises made by Nippon probably upset a few people on the political side, but don't, in my view at least, imply disruption to the production of steel in the U.S. The deal proposes to combine globally number four and number 27. So the first question for the uh, competition policy reviewers is, is it a global market you're defining when you review the deal or the national market? My sense is it'll be a global market. And if that's the case, we look at Japan as a strategic partner. It's difficult to imagine that if Japan can't close a deal like this, that anyone can close a deal like this. Do you think the Biden administration has been consistent with industrial policy? On one hand, talking about America first in some ways and uh, talking about unionization, but not necessarily celebrating the fact that the United States is pumping a record amount of oil, which has really offset a lot of the prices, and kept gasoline low. I think they've been as consistent as you can be as a policymaker in this environment. A couple of points there. First, we have started from a very low point in industrial production and manufacturing. We gave away that base in the 90s and the first part of this century. Reclaiming it is going to take a long time. The report that the National Economic Council and the National Security Council put out in June of 2021 quantified how far back the U.S. is. The president then sought to make up a gap there. Congress joined them. This has been a bipartisan uh, effort, particularly in infrastructure. Uh, so we are way behind the ball when it comes to the, in the U.S. when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to chips, semiconductors. Uh, we have a long way to go. Deals like this have to be reviewed from all of those perspectives we talked about, but ultimately what's best for the U.S. in terms of short-term supplies and then longer-term building out of the industrial base. That's part of the president's proposal in the emergency supplemental, almost $60 billion for a defense industrial base, $3 billion of that to build more submarines. And you bring up chips, and that's where I want to go, because you think about the U.S.-China relationship, obviously still a lot of tensions there, a lot of that playing out in the semiconductor arena. But when you look over the totality of 2023, how has the U.S.-China relationship evolved? It has stabilized, and the optics are better, against the backdrop of severe competition. Competition across a lot of platforms, and that's not going to change. We see that almost daily. We saw it this week in critical minerals. Mm. And so uh, when China decides that it's not going to allow the export 
of processing technology for critical minerals, that's a shot across the bow. It again points to a deficiency in the U.S. industrial base and something that it, it's hard to make this political if you look at it from an economic standpoint. Of course, people will make it political, but making up for the deficiency will require decades, mm -hmm. not just years. Well, in the context of critical minerals and, of course, uh, the news that we saw this week, both on that front and also that U.S. steel, uh, Nippon deal, you talked about Japan as a strategic ally here. And when you think about the arena of critical minerals, uh, not miracles, minerals, and, uh, of course, the competition going on there, how important does that make Japan and potentially other partners? It's that last part, Katie, potentially other partners. Japan is critically important. There is no Indo-Pacific strategy which is important to this administration without Japan. And that goes back to my saying, if Japan can't close deals, then no one can. But it's the other players. What we saw at the beginning of the APEC week that didn't get a lot of attention was a national security partnership signed between Indonesia and the U.S. U.S. sends defense technology, defense know-how. Indonesia promises to send critical minerals eventually. It's part of a very sophisticated program. Sophistication is necessary given how far back the U.S. is, in my view. Taking a step back, you've gotten plenty of accolades for your research and for your uh, view forward, particularly when it comes to politics, which recently has been a black box uh, of absolutely impenetrable predictions. But I'm wondering next year what you see as some of the bigger market-related risks stemming from Washington, D.C. at a time where there's a lot on the table, not just industrial policy. I think there are big four. Uh, the first quarter will be consumed by fiscal policy. What does Washington do around funding for FY24 and what does it do about the supplemental requests around wars? I think that morphs into first, second quarter. What's the result of the Fed's business over the last two years? How does that play out in the economy? Normalization at this Part of the cycle means tightening. Normalization soon will mean the other side. <clears throat> that leads into, in my view at least, concerns about liquidity, both official liquidity, private liquidity. It is the, um, it's the topic very few people want to address in public, but something that pops up on a regular basis as a concern among traders all the time, both official and private liquidity. That morphs into the back end of the year and the elections and what's happening in terms of the outcome of the elections, what that implies for the country going forward and for policy in 2025. And just in terms of the market risk there, meaning that as liquidity tightens, people will be more focused on that and the potential deficit and the potential inability of the U.S. to spend well, and all of those issues. Well, that and the issues around the federal home loan banks, the administration is constrained the advances that they can make to member institutions. There's discussion about paying less for reserves at the Fed and forcing that money out into the economy or somewhere else. Um, there are, and, and as QT goes on, we have a lot of tightening of liquidity in the system to follow. Kim Wallace, thank you so much for being with us. Wonderful to see you in person. Kim Wallace of 22V Research, thank you. And Katie, I am right now looking at the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, it has fallen to $7.7 .7 trillion from a peak in April of 2022 of almost $9 trillion. So that's uh, some significant declines, $1.2 some trillion dollars of uh, coming in at a time where they're also raising rates. It kind of creates this issue. Do we understand how to game out the influence on markets from that decline in liquidity? The influence on market and the messaging, of course. You know, we talk about and maybe poke fun at Jerome Powell uh, for his communication missteps, but I do think it's going to be an interesting and potentially challenging needle to thread. You're cutting rates, but you're continu continuing to tighten via the balance sheet. How do you square that circle, and how much does that truly matter? Well, yeah. that's what we just heard from Marvin Lowe, that he was concerned that the Fed is going to start cutting rates before they finish their quantitative tightening. He said that's the wrong policy to go at. Uh, this has been one of the big questions going into next year, especially at a time of deficits. Right now, doesn't seem to be that much worry right now, given the fact that yields have come in more than a percentage point. I mean, really, the idea that they've come in 1.15% percentage points uh, since the recent peak in October for 10-year yields, 3.86%. That reduced the U.S. deficit a little bit. Uh, let's see if they can keep that going. New York crude up about a percent, uh, $74.69. Coming up next, we've got Julia Coronado of Macro Policy Perspectives as we await that key core uh, CPI or PCE, excuse me, data. This is Bloomberg.
two hours from the most important data point of the last trading week of the year. That's what it feels like. There's another week coming after this, or so I'm told. Right now, we are looking at markets really kind of in stasis after a pretty tumultuous couple of weeks. S&P futures basically flat down maybe a tenth of a percent, but what we're looking at is still hovering around that 4,800 mark, 4,793. The Russell 2000, honestly, to me, has been the highest flyer, the most interesting uh, of all of the pairs at a time where people seem to be shrugging off, Katie, uh, all of the growth concerns. Absolutely. That's playing out in the Russell 2000. You think about those small cap companies that really have just been uh, getting hammered when we've seen previous episodes of growth scares, uh, but they've been the outperformer. I am really interested to see how this market changes in about two hours times uh, when we get that, those PCE figures. It is very much holiday trading conditions. Not a lot of liquidity to be found. Which means we could get some pretty big moves at a time when we've seen at least some stability in the Treasury market compared to the recent volatility. To your 10 year, 30 year, just seeing uh, sort of this a persistent bid in as we assess some of the weaker uh, aspects of the market. I am thinking about Nike. I wonder how much something like that can really color people's perspective. 10 year yields 3.86%. Uh, we can see the two year yield 4.3%, really a, a market shift lower as people price out the idea of six rate cuts next year. We're looking at the lowest two-year yield right now, Katie, going back to May of this year. It is just amazing. And if the equity market is overbought, what do you call the bond market? Because the rally that we've seen over the past two months has just been breathtaking to watch. Which is part of the reason why people are interested in the fact that we have seen a little bit of divergence in the past couple of days between bonds and stocks. I do want to finish on currencies, given the fact that we are seeing dollar weakness pretty much across the board. Euro strength crossing that 110 line uh, for the first time going back Back quite a ways. We got back down to 106 after a while, uh, and we've really seen steady euro strength. How much is this because of European strength? I don't know. The data not necessarily coming in all that strong, but it really is the dollar weakness story, which could be something of, I don't know, a surprise heading into the beginning of next year. I'm looking right now at the euro, the strongest going back to July of this year, Katie. Well, it was exactly a week ago where we were sitting here with Damien Sassauer, and uh, I remember he told us over and over again about the dollar smile theory. Of course, the dollar does, does well when things are really good and when it's really bad. And if you think we're in the middle right now, maybe that means continued dollar weakness from here. We we can talk more about the dollar, sm dollar smile coming up. <laughs> dollar smile for a uh, Christmas holiday. Under surveillance this morning, the U.S. announcing new plans to target banks that facilitate payments for Russia's military industrial complex. It's the latest move by the Biden administration to try and restrict Vladimir Putin's ability to fund Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen saying, quote, we will not hesitate to use the new tools provided by this authority to take decisive and surgical action against financial institutions that facilitate the supply of Russia's Russia's war machine. Got to be honest, Katie, I have been reading a lot about the sanctions on Russia. I don't know how effective they've been. Frankly, all of the companies that were told to get out of uh, Russia or that were required to as a result of sanctions had to sell their remaining businesses at fire sales. And you know who capitalized? Russia, who took the mocha chino and made it like, you know, a mocha mocha chino, and then they sell it uh, under the same basic umbrella. And you think about where Russia stands right now. Basically, it's been able to continue to get new weapons, et cetera. So uh, that would suggest that maybe those sanctions aren't as effective as many would like them to be in the U Biden administration. Of course, we're approaching the two-year anniversary. It makes sense at this point that uh, the Biden administration is Treasury, et cetera, really looking for more ways to make that pain felt by Russia. And maybe uh, direct some of the money to Ukraine because it's not coming from Congress, at least not yet. Nike shares, meanwhile, tumbling. The company announcing it's looking for as much as $2 billion in cost savings after issuing a weak forecast for the second half. The sportswear giant said sales in China fell short of expectations, while the company's CFO added there are, quote, indications of more cautious consumer behavior around the world. Nike shares down severely. 11.5%. Uh, you could see uh, Puma, you could see Adidas falling in tandem, as well as Foot Locker and a whole host of others. I do wonder, you know, we always ask this how much is this specific to Nike? How much is this specific to a particular slice of the Chinese consumers that they sell to versus a real macro story? that maybe is what Patrick Harker was talking about with real weakness. Well, to the theme of the morning, those growth fears, I think the fact that, to your point, you do see a lot of competitors falling right now, Adidas, Puma, et cetera, suggests that at least investors are worried that this isn't just a Nike story, that this is an industry-wide story. And when does that industry-wide story turn into something that shows up in the broader economic numbers? And maybe they're worried because there's nothing else to worry 
about, so maybe it's an excuse True. to... I think it's December 22nd. I think so. I think that you're right. <laughs> this one uh, caught my attention, as I'm sure a lot of parents also read this, with conflicted feelings. Headset leading an $80 billion sell-off in some of China's biggest online names after the country imposed new curbs on gaming. Uh, China's top gaming regulator published draft, uh, draft rules aimed at clamping down on practices that encourage gamers to spend more money and time online. It's the latest crackdown from Xi Jinping's administration, which has long fought to curb gaming addiction. We can see Tencent shares down 12.4% uh, and a whole host of others. I have mixed emotions here. On one yeah. hand, not, not really for censorship. You know, I kind of think, you know, you kind of have to live and let live and give people that opportunity. On the other hand, as a parent, right? You know, I don't know if someone just took away some of the games and prohibited them from engaging with certain platforms. It would make my job easier. I understand that maybe I should just put better. Maybe it would uh, boost productivity, so to speak. But you can see really the surprise of these draft rules coming out in the share reaction. Really painful memories of 2021, of course. Uh, the last time we got that really broad-based China crackdown on the tech sector. I believe Tencent, that's its worst move lower in one day since 2008, which uh, we'll see if that's an overreaction. Well, two things. One, this really raises questions about how much confidence people can have to invest in China's tech sector after it's really underperformed the U.S., given this kind of unexpected interference. Mm -hmm. But two, it raises a question on the commitment of Xi Jinping to the culture versus the economic backdrop of the country. Because for a long time, he's been kind of trying to push the culture aspect more, even at the expense of the economy. And now there's a feeling that maybe there's a little bit more of a push-pull, but not that much. And that's what this really shows, that still the cultural aspect rating supreme on some level. I think that's also why you're seeing this big reaction in the shares, because, I mean, it seems like the narrative that has started over the past couple months or so, of course, everyone came into this year expecting this to be a really great year for China's economy, or at least better. That hasn't been the case. There was some talk of maybe that would force Xi Jinping's hand, but uh, just looking at the news this morning, it doesn't appear to be the case. Meanwhile, we are about two hours away from the key data point of the day, which is core PCE. Joining us now, Julia Coronado, president and founder of Macro Policy Perspective, Perspectives. Julia, what do you expect uh, us to see at 8.30 today, and how much will it matter? Well, I think what we're going to see is um, the consensus on our Bloomberg screens is a little bit stale. I think we're going to get a flat reading on core PCE inflation, the Fed's preferred gauge of underlying trends, and that will take the annual rate down to 3.1 percent. Um, these are numbers that we already sort of had a foreshadowing of from the CPI and then the PPI. And even Chair Powell cited the 3.1 percent number in his December press conference. So I think the market has largely uh, sort of uh, absorbed that information. Uh, nonetheless, seeing that codified in the official data, um, that's the annual rate will be 3.1%. But on a three-month and six-month annualized basis, we're going to be just below 2%, mm. uh, the Fed's target. So um, really, it looks like the uh, inflation beast has uh, been slayed um, in you know, again, not calling total victory yet, but the signs are that the inflation dynamics have really exited that pandemic. And I think some of the things that you were just discussing with Nike uh, and consumer uh, finickiness shows that consumers are back in control of pricing power, uh, that, that uh, pandemic wave of pricing power that companies enjoyed um, is, is gone. And, and now they have to offer consumers deals to get them to part with their money. And uh, that's good news for inflation, good news for the prospect of, of Fed rate cuts in 2024. And the fact that uh, consumers may be back in the driver's seat here, does that lead to deflation? I keep thinking about uh, that warning, if you want to call it that, from the Walmart CEO that we got a few weeks ago. Are we going to start seeing retailers actually lower their prices? Yes, so we are seeing that on the good side. And that was, um, you know, good foreshadowing from the Walmart CEO. We have seen that in the data. Finally, we are seeing some reversion in the price level. So not just prices uh, are not just stopping going up, but they're actually falling. Uh, we see that in cars, but we're also increasingly seeing it outside of cars. We're seeing that in a broad range of goods. That doesn't mean broad deflation because services inflation continues to be the driver, which it tends to be the pattern that we saw pre-pandemic. Mild goods deflation and services inflation that on average 
uh, leaves us around 2%. So I think that's the world we're back in. We may actually see a little bit, especially during the holiday season, more of that pressure on the price level. So out outright price declines in electronics and in, in big ticket items in particular. Uh, but they're coming from very, very high levels. So there is room to fall. And Julia, just spinning that thought forward, of course, we're also at 10 a.m. getting those University of Michigan sentiment readings as well. And even though we've seen a bit of an uptick when it comes to some of these sentiment surveys, still at pretty depressed levels, uh, taking a historical perspective. But if we did start to see retailers maybe lowering their prices, maybe on the good side, things getting a little bit less expensive, what would that mean from a sentiment standpoint? Well, I think we would probably continue to see that, that sentiment recover. Uh, we have had this conundrum of low sentiment and, you know, fantastic economic indicators. Um, and, you know, that seems to be that disconnect seems to be a uniquely U.S. phenomenon. Uh, and, you know, we can sort of wonder why that is the case. Um, at the end of the day, though, consumers have been spending. So sentiment is always a very uh, unreliable predictor of actual behavior. Um, as long as consumers have jobs, they will spend exactly how much they spend and with, you know, how much they lean into the holidays, et cetera, is, uh, it, you know, is certainly up in the air still. But they are spending. Um, hiring is on track. So we still have that positive feedback loop, at least in the U.S. economy. There's more global weakness. Nike cited China. Uh, the U.K. numbers didn't look so great. So globally, there's a, a little bit more weakness. The U.S. has been the leading economy of this cycle and continues to be. We've been boosting our Q4 GDP tracking as the data come in yet again, um, and, and it still looks pretty solid. Julia, as far as headwinds for next year, I am wondering about the potential for a weaker dollar, which is not what a lot of people have been expecting, but we've been seeing. Does that raise the specter of importing inflation or not at least uh, importing disinflation, which is essentially what's gone on with such a strong dollar? Yeah, I, you know, the dollar has certainly played a role in, in contributing to, to some of the, the uh, easing and in inflation that we've seen, but it's not the primary driver. I think the primary driver really is the normalization of supply chain operations globally, and that continues to look pretty good with the caveat of, of what we've been seeing uh, in, in the Middle East. But uh, overall, still a much smoother picture for goods flow. And commodity prices just, you know, yes, uh, dollar weakness could, could put some pressure, but you know, generally speaking, that was the dog that didn't bark in 2023, right? Everybody came in thinking China reopening, upward pressure on commodities. You know, we're in a new regime of globalization that's going to be putting upward pressure on commodities. Just has not materialized. So input costs are subdued. Uh, supply chain pressures are fine. So I don't really see a resurgence of, uh, of, of goods inflation should the dollar uh, weaken. The dollar weakening is seems to me, I would think, to be mostly tied to expectations for easier Fed policy. And again, the Fed has some room. Uh, the Fed moves so aggressively, they have a little bit more room to cut than some of the other global central banks. Julia Coronado, thank you so much. And Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. See you in the new year. Thank you for all of your uh, contributions to surveillance. Julia Coronado of Macro Pol uh, Policy Perspectives. She's talking about the likelihood of actually killing the beast of inflation. And this is basically right now the consensus trade. The Bank of America fund manager survey that came out earlier this week showed that 62 percent of respondents expect bond yields to fall. Mission accomplished. There you go. Yeah, you buying it? At least 62% of people are, if you think that's the trade. And this is sort of going to be the key question as we wait for the data that comes out in less than two hours' time. Coming up, Javier Blas of Bloomberg Opinion on oil, especially with Angola leaving OPEC. What does that mean in terms of the integrity of the oil union? This is Bloomberg. I think on the margin, commodity prices are likely to be rising from here, and, and there are a number of indicators to lead us to that conclusion. There are going to be a lot of uh, geopolitical headlines in the coming year, whether it's elections or further issues or challenges around hotspots in the world. 
and commodities can help hedge against that. That was Eric Knutson of Newberger Berman telling us why he expects commodity prices to rise despite some of the recent turmoil. Uh, oil extending its biggest weekly gain in two months as Houthis escalate their attacks in the Red Sea. Angola, meanwhile, announcing its exit from OPEC, which has perhaps another significance. Javier Blas of Bloomberg Opinion saying the departure is more critical than it seems, writing, quote, it makes it more likely that Riyadh will have to let the UAE produce even more oil over time. The risks for OPEC start in Luanda, but ultimately end up more dangerously in Abu Dhabi. Javier, I'm so pleased to say, is joining us now. I want to start there. This was a, a sort of a significant move, considering that it has been a while since any kind of member state left the OPEC union. What was the reason for why and why is it so pivotal? Well, uh, Angola has been having a fight with OPEC and particularly Saudi Arabia about how much oil uh, Angola can produce in 2024. Uh, Angola has been struggling with uh, meeting his own OPEC uh, target level and Saudi Arabia wanted to reduce those, those targets. At the end, there was a big fight on the last OPEC meeting. Angola said they was not going to recognize the new uh, production targets introduced for the African country and ultimately uh, yesterday announced that it was leaving the cartel. At first sight, you say, well, this is not significant, this is irrelevant, because Angola is a very small producer within OPEC, and, and actually he cannot really increase production, whether it's inside or outside the cartel. But I think that, to me, is more interesting what he says about the, the battles that there are within uh, OPEC, the internal battles, and particularly the battle between the United uh, Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. The UAE wants to produce more oil, has been uh, fighting a, 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 an internal campaign to get a higher quota. It got his way a bit this year, and I think that they are not done, and I think that they're, over time they're going to be trying to push for more production within the OPEC limits. If you zoom out, this is sort of set against the backdrop of the United States pumping a record amount of oil, more than 13 million barrels a day. Their increase in production has really outstripped anything we've seen in recent history from the OPEC members. And this raises a question, have some of the cuts of Saudi Arabia essentially subsidized the U.S. shale industry and forced the, uh, the union to lose some of its market share to the United States? Uh, that has been happening. I mean, if you look at uh, the production cuts uh, implemented through the last year by Saudi Arabia unilaterally and OPEC uh, coordin uh, in coordination uh, among themselves. Those uh, cuts have served to uh, boost prices at times close to $100 a barrel. And that has been subsidized in the U.S. shale industry and, and perhaps more dangerously for OPEC. One thing that has happened over the last year is that both the U.S. shale industry has been growing production, but it has been making money and rewarding shareholders. This is very different to what the shale industry was um, a few years back in that period of 2014, 2015, where it was growing production, but it was not making much money and certainly it was not paying the shareholders. Now it's doing both. It can grow production and it can pay shareholders. This is more sustainable. The longer than Saudi Arabia and OPEC keep prices where they are, about $75, $80 a barrel, the more the U.S. shale industry is going to be growing. And some people have made the connection between what we've seen when it comes to U.S. shale production and what we saw in 2014. Of course, uh, the last time we saw a big episode of U.S. shale production strength, you saw OPEC really flood the market with crude to try to gain back that market share. Is there any risk that we see a repeat this time around? The, the, the market, Wall Street, is really um, uh, very excited about this, this theory. The flus, the market, uh, where Saudi Arabia in 2024 will increase production, bring prices down, and, and therefore regain control of the market, kill that growth in, in the shale industry. I don't see that happening yet. I think that the Saudis are still confident that their analysis of the market is right, that the demand is going to be strong, that the non-OPEC growth will slow down in 2024, and that therefore they will be able to start increasing production over time. Uh, that, that means the Saudi production, the OPEC production. But I think that it's very risky, and, and it really 2024 is going to be a, a make or break year. Either the Saudis are right on their analysis of the market, and the slowdown in, in U.S. shale growth materialize, or therefore uh, they have a problem, prices are too high, and therefore they need to change the strategy. We're going to see it, but I think that that doesn't come really until the second half of the year, the second half of 2024, and I believe that the jury is out on what scenario is most likely to happen.
So a lot to keep an eye on in 2024. Let's talk a little bit more about OPEC membership because you point out in your column that, uh, of course, if you look past over the past couple of years, Indonesia, Qatar, Ecuador, all making the decision to leave OPEC and, of course, Angola just this week. Do you see more exits to come? Potentially, we can see some, some exits. Uh, I mean, there, there are a number of countries uh, within OPEC that one wonders what they are exactly doing there. I mean, uh, but th their production is insignificant in the, global, uh, in the global scheme. I mean, thinking about countries like Republic of Congo, of Equatorial Guinea, I don't think that they gain much from, from the membership. Perhaps more important, looking at the membership of the OPEC Plus group, that enlarged group uh, of allies that work alongside um, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia. We saw Mexico participating initially and then um, taking more of an observer status uh, where it still participates on the meetings but it doesn't take any production action. I will be keeping an eye perhaps on Kazakhstan, a country that has really struggled to meet with any production cuts mandated by, by the OPEC plus group. But uh, as I warn on my column, we have to be very careful about not uh, really rushing the obituary of OPEC. I think that the three most dangerous wars in the, in the oil market, the three wars that could get you uh, completely wrong, is to say OPEC is dead. Don't, don't, don't say it that yet. The, the, the death of OPEC has been really grossly exaggerated. I love the three most dangerous words in uh, oil is OPEC is dead. The three most dangerous words in investing is this time is different. Uh, I guess that that's four words. But I'm just, uh, Javier, looking forward, I am wondering if the conclusion may be underpinning everything that you're saying is that even if OPEC doesn't fall apart, there is going to be a lot of pressure not to cut production too much, and thus that there's going to be a lot of supply that's going to pressure prices for the foreseeable future. I think to me the focus into 2024 is supply. How much oil is coming from the United States? How much oil is coming from Brazil? How much oil is coming from Guyana? Also, keep an eye on how much oil is going to be coming from Canada uh, next year. Uh, I am more concerned about the supply for a source of instability for oil prices than the demand. I know that a lot of people worried about global oil demand growth. I see that as doing fine. Probably we are going to get 1.1 uh, million barrels a day uh, extra in 2024. That is within the normal that we are coming back to what historically was normal, uh, a million barrels a day plus of incremental demand. That has been the average of the last 20 years. Uh, the increase last uh, in 2023 of more than 2 million was because of the recovery from COVID. We are back to normal, but I don't think that global oil demand is any way weakening significantly. Javier Blas of Bloomberg Opinion, thank you so much for being with us. Always wonderful to get your perspective and uh, some insight and what not to say. OPEC is dead. Let's not say that. I'm going to put that on the naughty list. Do not say that. <laughs> exactly. You know, I got to say, yesterday we were speaking with uh, Frank De uh, Aquila of, uh, of uh, Sullivan Cromwell, and he was talking about the merger and acquisition uh, backdrop. And he was talking about how the medical uh, consolidation that he expected was significant. We're already seeing some of it. This just out from the Wall Street Journal that Bristol Myers Squibb reached a deal to buy a neuroscience drug developer, Karuna Therapeutics, for $14 billion. Uh, this is basically Bristol paying $330 a share in cash for Karuna and his experimental schizophrenia drug, which is now up for U.S. governmental approval. I will just say, okay, you might say, I don't know any of those drugs. It's not Ozempic, so what's the bigger trend? Can we really get into it? But here's the thing. This is interesting to me mm -hmm. because it goes to exactly what Frank was talking about. Mm -hmm. that is Essentially, you need a bigger suite of drugs because any one of them needs to pull their weight at any given time and the generic sort of cycle takes off the revenues pretty quickly. So you need a big pipeline and the way to do it is consolidation. You are starting to see it after a year that basically has been some knowledge when it comes to all m and Exactly. Yeah, you think about that uh, stat that we trotted out yesterday. Globally speaking, uh, falling below that three trillion mark for the first time since 2013. It's going to be really interesting, of course, uh, when we start to see consolidation in the medical space, in the energy space. We're starting to see that already. What that portends for 2024, especially if the Fed does actually cut rates in a meaningful way. It feels like that's been the holdup for a lot of different industries. But it matters why they're cutting, right? I mean, again, yeah. this goes to this question, if they're cutting because people are feeling bad and the weakness is really... So maybe you pervading. band together, pool your resources and weather the Hug storm. each other. <laughs> maybe that's what we're going to see next year. Kumbaya. Coming up next, Kumbaya with Eddie Ardeni of Ardeni Research, who's been talking about the roaring 20s. He has gotten it right, at least for 2023. How about 2024 at a time where there are great expectations for uh, immaculate disinflation? Right now, we are seeing not a lot of action to end uh, the week. We're seeing uh, basically a flat S&P. Ten-year yields, 3.86%.
the market goes too far on its own, then the question will be, what more does the Fed need to do? The Fed is likely to cut next year, but every time the Fed announces cuts, the market doubles those cuts. The reality is the Fed may get us to a hotter landing, but the markets have to adjust to that, and they haven't. If the markets are rallying, that's okay with the Fed. The Fed doesn't have to push back on a rally because they don't like a rally. I do think the Fed put us fairly back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. 90 minutes until the most important moment of the week. Good morning from New York City worldwide. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, Tom and John, both off today. Katie Greifeld, very much in. Thank you for being with us. I was waiting for this call. I mean, <laughs> I was thrilled to come back this morning. All right. Well, I'm so glad that you're here. It's always a wonderful thing. I'm curious what you're looking for in about 90 minutes when we get core PCE, the most important data point, arguably, of the week and heading into the end of the year. Is it this continued March lower? in inflation. What do we start to see here? Of course, uh, when we heard from Jerome Powell last week, I thought one of the more interesting things he said is that he doesn't necessarily expect the last mile of inflation to be that difficult. And that had really been one of the themes of this year. When you think about the economic community, we haven't really seen that so far. And in this last leg to 2%, uh, at least Powell thinks it's going to be smooth sailing. Really echoing what we heard from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, just days before. What we're seeing right now is uh, PCE, core PCE, is around 3.46%. Currently, the expectation is for it, for it to come in at 3.3%, uh, and that's down from a high in February of 2022 of 5.6%. So a big way, can we get all the way down? And this comes along with this question of, okay, but does it come down with the ongoing strength that we continue to see in almost all of the indicators and earnings as well? And does that really affect how people feel about this economy? I mean, this is one of the running themes that we've been talking about, is that people are still miserable. You've seen that in the sentiment surveys, even with a tick up, we're still historically depressed. And that's because the absolute level of prices, it's still super high. Maybe it's just because we're all addicted to social media. Yeah, so we're all on TikTok. Just, <laughs> just looking at horrible images and trying to... Uh, Get in carpal tunnel. Exactly. So it's a really good, wonderful, beautiful thing. Good morning. Anyway, taking a look at markets right now, we do see uh, a little bit of just a range bound stasis as we head into the end of the week. 47.95 uh, S&P futures basically flat. Euro dollar to me is really interesting. 110.27 uh, up just a hair but still eking over that 110 line to the highest level for the euro. The strongest euro versus the dollar going back to July. And this is not coming because of European strength. I think that that's important to note and I want to sit on that for a second. Katie, this is in the expectation that the U.S. is going to cut rates even into strength and that the European region is not going to just simply because that has not been the rhetoric out of the central bankers. Yeah, you've seen that divergence, at least when it comes to the rhetoric from the Fed, from the ECB. How long that's sustainable, uh, maybe before the ECB has to bend to what the Fed is doing, that feels like the playbook that typically goes. But for at least right now, it's been to the benefit of the euro, the fact that you do have that goal. And meanwhile, what you are seeing in the U.S. is a real consensus trade, that you are going to get inflation lower, that the last mile won't be that difficult, and that you see yields coming in and 60 percent in the recent uh, fund manager survey done by Bank of America found that they expect yields to go lower next year. And you're seeing that in price action today, about 3.86% on the 10-year. Here's what we're looking at for the day ahead. 8.30 a.m., personal income and personal spending, as well as drumbeat, the PCE core deflator. This, to me, is the key indication, considering that the Fed watches it and may hinge off of this disinflationary narrative to continue with their thoughts about rate cuts, whether they admit it or not. 10 a.m., new home sales, as well as University of Michigan sentiment survey that will also be getting forward-looking projections for inflation expectations. Does sentiment start to pick? up. And Katie, you raised a really good point, which is sentiment has been very depressed. Do we see that start to shift, especially because oil prices are down? This tends to track pretty inversely with oil prices uh, and gasoline prices. But also because if you take a look at the sort of mood, particularly with markets, it's making people feel a little bit more holiday spirits. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what that means for markets, for the economy, when we do see sentiment pick up. Uh, Julia Coronado made the great point to us that it's been a really re unreliable predictor of consumer behavior. Which is the reason why, I guess, Jonathan Farrow 
tries to dismiss <laughs> it. Today, the Treasury markets are closing at 2 p.m. because they got the message and are happy about the holidays. Stock traders can stay in their seats until uh, 4 p.m. So we will figure out whether they will eventually get on board and close early as well. Joining us now is someone who's gotten it right all year. Eddie Yardeni, president of Yardeni Research, called for the Roaring Twenties, is leaning into that now, talking about disinflation. We're seeing it now. What keeps you up at night, Ed, considering that so far you've gotten a lot of things very right? Well, I've been sleeping pretty well, quite honestly. Um, I, I guess I do worry about the uh, Middle East, the geopolitical situation, uh, the, the fog of war. You never know how things uh, unfold w once a war starts. And we have this fairly contained localized war uh, in Gaza. And uh, that the risk is that it becomes a regional war and it affects the price of, uh, of oil. But so far, the price of oil has been telling, telling, me, telling me that uh, there's not going to be a, a regional war. Uh, going on here any anytime soon. So putting aside uh, some of those tail risks, is the risk in your mind that people aren't bullish enough, considering that everyone's been uh, upping their expectations right. for end of the year targets, but we're catching up to it really quick already, and it hasn't even been the end of the year. Yeah, I think that's true. I uh, At the beginning of the year, I was talking about 4,600. That wasn't bullish enough. We're already above that uh, for the end of this year. And then I'm looking for 5,400 next year and now there's uh, more people talking about over 5,000 and then for 2025 I'm talking about 6,000 so I, I, th I think I'm bullish enough I, I don't think uh, things can get much better than that so that's that's kind of at the top end of the scale on, on optimism I think uh, but I think in the near term here we've got uh, everybody seems to be too happy uh, at least in terms of the sentiment indicators so that's on a near term basis I don't lose any sleep over it but I do watch it. And with only, what, a week or so left until 2024, the fact that everyone is maybe too happy right now, is that why you haven't boosted your year-end target for this year? I believe that was at 4,600, and uh, we're pretty firmly above that right now, Ed. Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't uh, fine-tune my, my, my forecast uh, that much because uh, we are, as you said, we're only a week away, so what's the point of uh, getting cute about it? Uh, instead, I'm, uh, I did, did uh, talk, I am talking about 5,400, by the end of next year and 6,000 after that. So that's that just puts me in the bullish camp it's pretty pretty clearly. Yeah, if I, uh, of course, had to put out these forecasts, I think I'd revise on like December 30th every year and just nail it every single time. But I do want to talk a little bit about 2025 because 6,000 is a staggering number and 2025 feels very, very far away. What is the work that gets you there and how do you project that with uh, a certain degree of confidence? Well, uh, first, uh, and, and a short-term basis, um, looks like there's still some uh, what I call die-hard hardlanders who think that we're going to have a recession next year. I've been talking about a rolling recession for the past two years, and I think uh, in the next in the next two years we'll have rolling recoveries. Uh, clearly, we're starting to see a rolling recovery in the housing market. I think we've bottomed in terms of uh, retail. Uh, uh, merchandise, a lot of uh, inventory is piled up. Now I think consumers are going to go back next year and buy some goods in addition to services. And I think commercial real estate will uh, be in a rolling recession uh, in this coming year. But then beyond that, I think there will be a recovery. So I, I think uh, that's the way I look at the business cycle is sort of spread out. But most importantly, I think we've got a labor shortage, significant chronic labor shortage. And I think companies will uh, use technology to increase productivity dramatically. Right now, we're averaging about 1.8% over the past five years. I think that by the end of the decade, we'll be looking at 35 to 4.5%, which sounds uh, far-fetched, if not delusional, I admit. Uh, but uh, that's the way uh, productivity boom cycles have gone in the past. And this one should do the same. Does it worry you at all? And I realize that anecdotes can't tell entire stories and you can't extrapolate out an entire research paper from one particular example. But let's take a look at Nike. They came out and they said that they're going to be cutting workers. They're going to be having cost cuts. And it is because, uh, yes, they are working down their inventory, but because of weakness and weakness that they expect to continue going mm -hmm. forward. Does that kind of contradict some of your optimism about the recovery in the re retail space? Yeah. Well, that's a good point. And that's why I think uh, a lot of forecasters missed the, the past couple of years and had this attitude that uh, or view that the only way inflation could come down in the United States is if we have a recession. Uh, you mentioned the, the phrase immaculate uh, dis disinflation. 
And I think that's what we've had. We've had inflation come down without a recession. And the reason for that is because the Chinese and the Europeans have done us a great favor. They've had the recession. So on a global basis, uh, particularly China has been exporting deflation. And their PPI is down on a year over year basis. Even their CPI is down a little bit on a year over year basis. So I think the United States is uh, going to uh, benefit from uh, the recession, uh, the property depression in China for a long time in terms of having a low inflation. And I think Europe starts to recover from its shallow recession next year, which will help us on the export side. And let's bring this conversation to the bond market because uh, the reversal that we've seen there has been stunning. And of course, you've done a lot of great work on deficits, what that means for bonds and the demand for bonds. And it right. felt like for a while, maybe the bond vigilantes were mm -hmm. reappearing. Why right. did deficit concerns seem to fall off the radar? Yeah, I've, I've uh, had the point of view for many years that I'll care about the deficit when the bond market cares about the deficit. In the past, supply really hasn't been much of a problem because you get the biggest supply in recessions when interest, the Fed was cutting interest rates. Uh, we had this brief period where the bond vigilantes saddled up and started to, uh, to move uh, on concerns of uh, fiscal excesses, and that uh, period didn't last very long, uh, basically from August to October. We saw this uh, monstrous increase in uh, the 10 year bond yield from basically four and a quarter percent to five percent. And here we are back below four uh, percent. I think, uh, you know, there's an expression uh, don't fight the Fed. Um, maybe we should also say don't fight Janet Yellen now that she's a Treasury, uh, she, because she very cleverly cut back on the supply of uh, long term bonds and notes and uh, issued a lot of bills. And the bond vigilante said, oh, if that's the way you're going to play the game, we can live with that. Meanwhile, I think the big story has been how inflation's come down. I mean, it's been only the past couple of months that the consensus really has become that we can't have uh, immaculate uh, disinflation. Uh, even Fed Chair Powell in his press conference seemed to indicate that, you know what, we, we may actually get it. And everybody let out a collective cheer, and you still hear that cheer today. Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, have a wonderful, wonderful end of the year, and thank you so much for everything uh, that you've been uh, giving us through the year in terms of insights. I am just looking right now at the forward-looking expectations for inflation baked into Fed funds futures and baked into uh, break-even rates. Break-even rates now. 2.13% when you look out five years, five years forward. So between five and 10 years out from here. Shocking. There you go. And of course, we're going to uh, get a read on what in consumers and uh, actual people think about in terms of their inflation expectations. That's coming at 10 a.m. in that University of Michigan release one year out and five to 10 years out. The one year inflation look ahead currently at 3.1 percent. That is the expectation, at least. If you are just joining the program, uh, we could see a little bit of a range bound market, maybe a little negative inflection, but really nothing to write home about. 47.95 lower, just a touch, but basically flat on the S&P. Coming up at 8 a.m., we've got Joe Quinlan of Merrill and Bank of America Private Bank as we parse through some of the investing themes heading into 2024, what the consensus trade has been, what it will be. I honestly think that right now the consensus is that we're going to get to disinflation. It's going to be steady. It's going to be accompanied maybe with some bumps. Those are all viable bumps, evidently, because we heard everybody say buy the dip yesterday. And that we'll trot, uh, we'll trot forward and somehow move to the next phase of the cycle with maybe a recession that's very shallow or no recession at all. That's the consensus that it feels like to me. And it's pretty amazing. Again, you think about this time last year, it feels like everyone everyone said that the recession is coming in 2023. Of course, some people were banding about the idea of a soft landing. Uh, and then that turned into kind of a meme. Everyone was making fun of it. And here we are a year later, and it looks like a real possibility. Which maybe is the reason why Kim Wallace uh, of uh, 22V Research maybe said the most interesting thing uh, so far in terms of the lack of liquidity mm -hmm. as the balance sheet keeps coming down as some of the effects of uh, some of the higher rates come through the system. Do we start to see liquidity issues? both on the public and on the private side. Definitely uh, one huge thing to watch. That balance sheet hasn't really made much of a bite yet. Maybe that changes in 2024. Coming up, we're going to be speaking with Bloomberg's Michael Shepard in Washington on myriad issues going on both domestically and internationally. This is Bloomberg. countries together are committed to enabling Ukraine to stand on its own, to stand on its own strongly, militarily, economically, 
democratic. That's why President Biden's supplemental budget request is so critical and why we'll continue to work with Congress to pass it. That was U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking in Denmark as the two countries sign a defense cooperation agreement. Blinken highlighting the need for more Ukraine aid. This comes as the U.S. does announce uh, some new sanctions on banks found to be facilitating payments for Russia's military industrial complex. This according to Bloomberg reporting. It's the latest move from the Biden administration to curb Vladimir Putin's ability to fund Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Michael joining us right now. Michael Shepard, uh, executive editor, joining us now from Washington, D. I do want to get your sense about how much this move to uh, sanction certain financial institutions is sort of a, a uh, makeshift way to try to bridge the gap between Congre Congress funding Ukraine uh, in the new year. Well, the timing of this certainly looks to be more than a coincidence. Uh, Congress left town uh, earlier this week, as you noted, without passing this very critical funding package that the president had asked for back in October. It would have been $60 billion in new money to help fund Ukraine's war effort, and they just couldn't get it done. Uh, there were disputes over the border, and that has held it up until early next year. So where that has left Joe Biden is looking for another way to go after Russia and try to somehow slow Putin's role as he is uh, gaining, if not ground in, uh, in Ukraine itself, but at least gaining momentum. Do you get the sense that there is enough critical mass to actually get some sort of additional aid passed for Ukraine in the new year? Or is this going to really drag out beyond what Ukraine can handle in order to uh, keep up their counteroffensive? Well, that's a great question, because what we're seeing is lawmakers saying that they will take it up in the new year before leaving town. Chuck Schumer on Tuesday told reporters, including some of ours up on Capitol Hill, that it was just a difficult issue to get agreement on. And it's not just the Ukraine aid. Uh, the support remains high on Capitol Hill and in uh, the American public. When you look at uh, surveys nas taken nationally, they still support Ukraine's war effort. The trouble is, a number of lawmakers, including some Democrats, are wondering whether we need more border security and more needs to be done as a record number of migrants come here. So that has been the issue standing in the way. They will have to get this done when they come back the week of January 8th with only 10 days before another big deadline where they have to enact a funding package to avoid a government shutdown. And I definitely want to get to that government shutdown. But when it comes to the border, you mentioned that has been a hurdle when it comes to actually getting this Ukraine aid passed, despite broad support still. How high is that hurdle, though? When, uh, of course, Congress comes back and this is back being debated, is what does that compromise, what do those negotiations look like? Well, part of it, Katie, right now boils down to who will blink first, in a way, and who will be willing to give some more ground. Republicans are sensing a political advantage right now. When you look at even Democratic cities like New York and Chicago and Los Angeles, they have been inundated with new arrivals, people seeking shelter, people seeking asylum, and it is costing those cities a lot of money. New York is reporting that it will incur a deficit of as much as $7 billion in the coming year. So the pressure is real, and the pressure is being applied to the Biden administration. Democrats, however, find that some of the Republican measures for now, the ones that they are calling for, are too restrictive and too harsh. And of course, uh, those discussions will be complicated if the government does indeed shut down. And when we think about the past year or so, it's been defined by these last minute deals that averted at the last minute. Is that the playbook that we should be expecting this time around? It's already last minute. By the time January 8th and 9th roll around when the two chambers get back into town, they will have almost no time on the calendar to actually get one of these spending packages through. And that means they will have to put together something very quickly, very quickly on the fly. And it runs the risk of upsetting some of the hardliners and new House speakers uh, Mike Johnson's Republican majority, and they will hold his feet to the fire. And if he doesn't meet their demands on spending or on social policy in one of these spending packages, he could be in trouble. Meanwhile, uh, we've been talking about Ukraine and some of the aid uh, there. When it comes to Israel and aid for that country, how much is there a little bit more dissent within the, the uh, president's own party as we head into the new year and as the president's uh, own ambassadors have been basically encouraging Israel to take a very different tact in the new year? Well, that's right. On 
Israel. Uh, we are seeing the administration putting more pressure on uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's government to ease up on the offensive it has been waging in Gaza since the uh, attack in October by Hamas. What they are finding is that it has been uh, heavy-handed and not targeted enough against Hamas officials with far too many civilian casualties. Uh, the U.S. is backing now a resolution in the U.N. Security Council calling for a ceasefire, and this escalates and echoes calls by the administration directly with all this diplomacy we've seen from Anthony Blinken. Now, what that means for aid is that it's a reflection of uh, misgivings, especially within Biden's Democratic Party, over giving additional aid to Israel at this time. And I want to bring you a Quinnipiac University poll that I'm sure you saw, but I thought this was very interesting, that the poll found that support for sending financial aid to Israel to fund the war with Hamas is quickly deteriorating. In December, 45% of registered voters said that they want more aid for Israel. That is down from 54% last month. How does Biden, the presidential candidate, handle this issue? Well, Katie, that's a great question. And when the Quinnipiac poll came out the other day, that was when we were looking at the results, that was one of the things that really stood out to us, that this could be an area of vulnerability for Biden within his own party. In other words, that may mean that voters are less enthusiastic about the president as they head to the polls in November if this conflict and if those misgivings last that long. We are a long way from the election, of course. A long way from the election. I'm sure it's pretty much all we're going to be talking about next year, though. So let's talk a little bit more about it right now. Of course, Donald Trump seems to be, uh, of course, the GOP nominee. When do we start to see, start to see other GOP uh, hopefuls start to drop out? Well, the first big tests are coming up next month. On January 15th, we have the Republicans' first nominating contest in Iowa, and that will be a test of whether Trump's efforts there to score a decisive victory have paid off. He is really looking to put so much distance between him and the next two second-tier candidates, uh, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, that there is no way for them to catch back up. Nikki Haley, however, is gaining some ground in New Hampshire, which holds the nation's second nominating contest, the prior primary there, on January 23rd. And what we could see is that if she keeps it close or somehow even pulls off an upset, that that could change the state of the race a little bit heading into the third primary, and that's in her home state of South Carolina later in February. Bloomberg's Michael Shepard, thank you so much, as always, and uh, wonderful to see you. Have a wonderful new year and happy holidays. Uh, coming up next, we've got Deborah Cunningham of Federated Hermes. But before we do, I've got to say, as I was thinking about the sort of political season next year, I don't know. I, I'm curious about which, which narrative is actually going to end up being the driving force, given mm -hmm. that right now we're talking geopolitics, but almost always it comes back to the economy and to domestic issues. And it's going to be really a, a different scene, potentially, on that front. Exactly. I mean, you think about the average American voter and its domestic concerns, the economy that really uh, tend to trump most things there. So it'll be really fascinating to see. And, of course, uh, that conversation around third-party candidates, we didn't get to it with Michael. It happens every cycle. But it is especially happening this cycle when you think about the likes of, of course, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., et cetera. And uh, when it comes to the GOP nominee, as Michael said, Nikki Haley, has been gaining some ground. Yeah, but still kind of dwarfed by Donald Trump. I do think it's interesting with Robert Kennedy. When I was looking at some of the poll numbers, he's pulling voters from both Trump and Biden. Mm -hmm. And it's a pretty significant critical mass. It's not a small amount of uh, voters. That said, how much of this is really just protest voting? I yeah. mean, when you talk about the actual polls that are inconsequential, people can just sort of feel angry and express it. It's kind of what we've been seeing in other polls. It seems like there's a lot of anger out there right now. Exactly. And when you're actually uh, in the ballot box in November, I think that, of course, that's the only thing that matters. These polls at this point, uh, a little less than a year out or so, how much do they actually portend for what the actual result will be? We're getting a read on anger uh, coming up today at 10 a.m. with the University of Michigan Centipet Survey. Maybe people will be feeling a little bit less uh, angry than they have been, or at least uh, not very good. Right now, we're basically seeing a very quiet market, 47.96 unchanged in S&P futures. Euro dollar, to me, this is really interesting, crossing the 110 mark for the first time since July. Six 
60 minutes till the most important data point of the morning, core uh, PCE deflator. That is the key metric. It sounds so exciting, but it's the key metric the Fed watches to understand where we are in inflation. In markets, it is a quiet day to start uh, the week or to end the week, I should say. It feels like we're ending the year right now. S&P futures and NASDAQ futures basically going nowhere. Russell 2000, a little bit of a lift up almost a tenth of a percent, which has basically been the way of the morning. In the bond space, you are seeing a bid. This, to me, has been the most consistent theme. And Katie, I really am watching this closely to understand, can we end the year? 3.85% on the 10-year, bang in line with where we started it. It would be really poetic, right? I mean, after all the turmoil, et cetera, that we uh, saw this year, we were really obsessed with the deficit, for example, for a hot minute. Uh, to end rate right where we started would be pretty amazing. Not obviously the case when it comes to the equity market. Quite a rally. The fact that the Bank of America Fund Manager survey that came out earlier this week showed that 62% 62% of all fund managers surveyed said that they expect bond yields to fall. This is the consensus right now pretty much out there, and that's what you're seeing in the bond market. Well, when do they start to migrate out the curve? Because we have $6 trillion or so sitting in money market funds, uh, the very shortest dated paper. It could be uh, an incredible move, or maybe they're happy with 4 to 5%. It kind of depends on rate cuts, which is the reason why we're watching the euro versus the dollar. The euro strengthening to the most strongest that we've seen going back to July crossing that 110 figure, 110.34 uh, versus the dollar at a time where people are expecting the U.S., the Federal Reserve, to cut rates more aggressively, maybe, than the ECB, even though the ECB maybe has more reason to cut, given uh, some of the more dismal data coming out of the region. Yeah, and if you take a look at what the uh, market expects, basically the same amount of rate cuts coming out from the ECB and the Fed, but they do expect the ECB to go first, or at least that was the balance when I checked a couple yeah, days yeah, ago. Yeah, when it could shift, given the fact. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, people seem to be kind of toggling between those two. Under surveillance this morning, core PCE due out in about an hour. A Bloomberg survey of economists predicting the index will fall to 3.3% in November from 3.5% the previous month. The data may bolster expectations of Fed rate cuts next year after data Thursday. Uh, yesterday suggested the economy is cooling. We did see that revision downwards in terms of GDP as well as that revision downward in terms of uh, inflation for the third quarter. To me, my real question is, what's the balance of risks in markets, right? Mm. An upside surprise or a downside surprise? What would be the most disruptive right now, given how much disinflation and rate cuts have been priced in? Well, it'll certainly be fun to watch the lines at 8.30 a.m. because it feels like everyone just rushed to one side of the boat. Uh, it's very heavy at this point, the positioning that's really been put on in the past two months. It picked up again last week, so the bar is pretty you know, low here for some sort of big move, especially when you think about it's December 22nd. Exactly. Keep checking that. So just to make sure it's still December 22nd. <laughs> it is. It, is it still is. Yeah. Thank you for that check. All yeah. right. Elon Musk, meanwhile, blasting public markets, saying indexing has gone too far. His latest rant uh, coming three day, uh, years to the day since Tesla joined the S&P. In an interview with ARK's Kathy Wood, he said pressure from shareholders limits company efficiency. Musk said keeping SpaceX private has allowed him to take more appropriate risk compared with Tesla and that he wouldn't recommend companies go public like, quote, unless they really have to. He also, I believe, talked before about Twitter, about X and how it's really nice that it's not public. I bet it is for him. I bet it is. I would think so. And of course, this happened on an X spaces. I don't know if exactly. you tuned in. I, I did not, but uh, I saw a lot of my the people I follow were. There's actually some really interesting pieces in here. We know that uh, Elon Musk doesn't love passive indexing. You know, he's made that point before. But the comments on staying private, of course, uh, that's been helping him out with Twitter. But to go public, I mean, there's a lot of annoying homework that comes along with that. The fact that you have to basically give out your report card four times a year. Not every company would want to be in that position. I love the offset, though. Then he said but it did allow Tesla to access public funding, exactly. which is exactly the point of going public. So, mm -hmm. I mean, to a certain degree, okay, how much is this griping about the fact that shareholders can be a pain in the butt and how much is this basically that they have to be held accountable versus uh, remaining private, taking a longer-term view? But he's not alone.
Yeah. Other people have a similar kind of feeling that if you can have a longer term view, it's better than short term kind of fixes for shareholders. And I mean, think about the IPO market over the past two years. It seems like a lot of companies have really agreed with that logic and applied it to themselves because we know there's companies in the pipeline that just don't want to come out yet. Especially not at valuations that might be a little suppressed based on the, some of the volatility we've seen this year. Meanwhile, the FDA is seizing thousands of counterfeit units from Ozempic, of Ozempic, I should say, from the U.S. drug supply chain. The regulator advising wholesalers, pharmacies, and healthcare practitioners to double check the information on the products they've received is they haven't been tested for quality or safety. Demand for the blockbuster weight loss treatment soaring in recent months. The manufacturer at Novo Nordisk saying they expect shortages continuing next year into Europe. Off market. <laughs> brand Ozempic that people are buying. They found that there were some side effects, but they were simply in line with other side effects from, you know, more uh, on brand kinds of things. Are there going to be people basically like going to alleyways? Do you have any Ozempic shots? I need no Ozempic I think shot. it's happening. I mean, you listen to public discourse and everyone, it seems like, wants to get their hands on Ozempic, but they can't. Supply is really constrained. Uh, not to make light of the situation, does fake Ozempic work? It has the same side effects. Does it have the same actual effects? I mean, are we going to really end up basically advertising fake Ozempic? Because I essentially, <laughs> essentially, they were, it does seem like it has a similar kind of side effect. But this raises this question about the barrier to entry mm -hmm. uh, and how much other companies are going to try to follow suit with similar types of drugs. We saw this from Eli Lilly. We saw this from others that are trying to get in, considering how hot the drug has been and how a lot of people are you know, indicated for it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's basically a gold rush that's going on right now. Uh, it feels like a lot of these drug makers are trying to come up with their response to Ozempic, their own type of Ozempic, because, uh, I mean, it's been one of the stories of 2023, that and artificial intelligence when it comes at least to the stock market. So we can all be skinny and basically outsource our uh, thinking to computers. Joining us now, Deborah Cunningham, Global Liquidity Market CIO at Federated Hermes, not on that at all. Uh, Deborah, thank you so much for being with us. I want to start with this idea that people uh, have been talking a lot about cash on the sidelines. And I, we've talked about this before and how cash on the sidelines sidelines are going to start flooding into risk assets. Have you seen any evidence of that over the past couple of weeks? Not really, Lisa. It's not something, generally speaking, people at the end of the year are trying to, you know, kind of allocate and close out their books in, in, the, in a normal fashion. And there may be some surprises, either cash inflows or cash outflows, things close, things don't close that we're so, supposed to. Um, but ultimately, it's not a great time in, in a normal situation for, you know, what I'd call reallocation. That happens more at the beginning of the year. So um, we have not been experiencing or seeing that type of, of market shift at this point and, and cash flow out. Well, I do want to get to what happens at the start of next year and in 2024, but I know I just said that AI and Ozempic have been really the stock market stories of this year, but I want to add a third thing, which has been the rush into money market funds. Of course, one of the big stories in markets this year, about $6 trillion sitting in money market funds right now. Where is that coming from? Is that investors saying, look at these high yields, I'm going to go there? Or is that people moving away, taking money out of their bank deposits for for example, and shifting into money market funds? I think the bulk of it is coming from the deposit market. Um, it's coming in as a retail trade, so it's a pretty steady trade. Um, and if you look at what shifted out of, of retail deposits in, during the year, it's been about 1.3 trillion, and about a trillion has gone into money market funds. So m it's hard to follow dollar for dollar exactly where cash goes. Um, but the, you know, from all we can tell, I'd say at least 80% of that is coming from the, the, the retail deposit uh, market where rates from a banking perspective just didn't follow you know, short-term rates uh, at, at, in the market upwards with the Fed. Now there has been in the last quarter, just really since we flipped into the fourth quarter, October and November, a little bit more of a cash flow from an institutional type of customer and i think that has to do with you know the 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 flattening to you know to some degree inverted yield curve where 
the shorter end of the curve is no longer as attractive necessarily as what a product that has some weighted average maturity like a money market fund does. So we're starting to see some of that trade. I would see more of I would expect to see more of that trade though in 2024. So just to meditate on that point a little bit longer that potentially 80% of what we've seen come into money market funds has been coming from uh, deposits. How sticky is that money? Because it feels like one of the assumptions is that what we're seeing in money market funds that belongs to the equity market or that belongs to risk assets and it's going to return there. But if that's coming from bank deposits, that logic doesn't quite make sense. That's exactly right, I, and, and certainly there is some, there are some risk assets that are in there as a hiding place, a, you know, a short-term home, until they feel like you know their entry point back into their risk asset class is um, more palatable for them. But that's certainly not the bulk of what we've been seeing. Now, maybe that you know will pick up again um, in 2024, but it's not been what we've seen mostly in 2023. It's come through the deposit market, through the retail trade, with the likely of that being very sticky. And I think the other thing that makes that a stickier trade than it has been even over the course of the last 15 years is we, as well as the market, and I don't think anybody out there expects the Fed to normalize at zero where they have been, you know, 12 out of the last 15 years. Um, the expectation is the normalization is back to, you know, three, three and a half, maybe four percent, depending upon where uh, inflation plays out. And so that again keeps that retail trade generally in the market rather than back rather than back in deposits. So do you just sort of reject, Deborah, this idea of cash on the sidelines flooding into markets once the Federal Reserve has cut rates one, two, three, or even more times next year? No, I don't reject it at all. I just don't think it's all coming out of money market funds. I think there, I think cash continues to come out of deposit products, and I think some some goes into the direct markets through that, you know, from that, from that mode. And I do believe there will be some that comes out of money market funds, but I certainly don't think it's, a, you know, it's it's the vast majority of of what will, you know, let's let's say fuel the markets, the risk asset markets in 2024. Just real quick here, Deborah, are you seeing money go out of short term and go into longer term? Is that a theme? It started. We run micro short and ultra short funds that are really just, you know, a modest step out the yield curve in the one to two, two and a half year sector. And we're starting to see positive cash flow in those products. But it's trickling. It's not a it's certainly not any kind of a flood. Deborah Cunningham, thank you so much for being with us. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Merry Happy Christmas. New Happy. Year. Deborah Cunningham of Federated Hermes. We appreciate uh, you being with us. And that's what we've been hearing from a lot of people that, yes, there is a lot of cash out there, but it's being put to work in short term uh, debt financing. If you are just uh, joining the program, we can see markets aren't doing much today. It is sort of sleepy ahead of that really important indicator coming out in about 45 minutes time. S&P futures lower by less than a tenth of a percent, 47.95. I will just say, did you catch this, Katie, uh, in the Financial Times, they did an interview with outgoing Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman, and he was saying that markets are really going to take off once the Fed uh, starts cutting rates. He said the shock of the rate increase recently has put a damper on banking deals and capital markets deals, and that is because everybody doesn't really know what their cost of financing is. That changes if the Fed starts cutting rates. And of course, it really depends what market you're talking about. Of course, that makes sense uh, for deal making that the Fed uh, finally cutting rates, those financing costs coming down would see a big resurgence there. But the equity benchmark level really hasn't, I mean, it's already priced in at this point. It's going to be interesting to see uh, what the catalysts in 2024 are. I would assume it's going to turn into how many cuts we actually get. I uh, love this from James Gorman, who just has days left as the CEO before he hands over his uh, his reign to Ted Pick. He said that the banking system had become much safer at his 14-year tenure leaving, quote, their own stupidity <laughs> as one of the biggest threats still facing banks. Maybe uh, a little tongue in cheek relative to some of the March turmoil. So they'll find some way to make their lives difficult, it sounds Didn't like. we see that in March? I mean, that was sort of part of the issue. Yeah. It was the mismatch in uh, maturities and the deposit base and the consolidation of the deposit base in particular industries versus the duration of some of their assets. And that, of course, has been a big boon for money market funds. It's all very full circle. Exactly. Especially 
especially since they're actually paying something and banks still are not paying very much on their savings accounts. Coming up at 8.30 a.m., the key economic indicator of the day, plus Michael Gapin weighing in on that, of Bank of America's securities. Right now, a quiet market as we finish up one of the last weeks of 2023. the summer we saw a dip down in airline traffic and especially domestically and we saw um, the domestic focused airlines lose money heading into December the numbers have come off a little bit um, maybe people are just waiting till later because um, Christmas is Monday versus a uh, middle of the week day and so you're seeing um, people getting ready to travel rather than traveling. That was Elaine Becker of TD Cowan on the state of travel this past summer. And of course, leading into uh, the Christmas holiday on Monday and then New Year's Eve right after that, a lot of people going on vacation. And this is uh, definitely a sort of personal issue for me where I'm always sort of girding for the worst. <laughs> I've had a lot of horror stories over uh, this particular break. Yeah, yeah. I hope you weren't flying Southwest last year. No, but I did once catch the last plane out oh. of JFK before it was closed down due to a snowstorm. Oh so, and then that was after being delayed for almost 24 hours with a nine month old. But nonetheless, you got are, out. I did get out and it was a little bit traumatic. Okay, so this is where I really want to get a sense of where we are heading into this, what kinds of disruptions we can expect, how people are paying for their travel, whether they are traveling. Brian Kelly, founder of The Points Guy, who did advise that I get rid of my points and spend them. Thank you for that, I'm trying to work them down. What do you expect in terms of this particular holiday season? Are we going to see another Southwest episode? Are things looking like they're pretty orderly? Are people going to have a not really deep, deeply uncomfortable experience? Well, I'm an internal optimist and things are looking really good, right? So the, uh, the Thanksgiving holiday in November, we saw the most amount of air travelers ever, 2.9 million go through the TSA and things were pretty smooth. And the biggest factor that I see would be weather. And right now there's no major weather patterns that I see that could upend our air travel system. So I am forecasting hopefully smooth sailing uh, for the next 10 days. We had 2.5 million people through the TSA yesterday, relatively low delays and cancellations. So fingers crossed, but I think this is going to be a good holiday travel season and certainly much better than last year. <laughs> Especially given some of those delays. International, though, uh, does face some potential uh, headwinds, in particular some of the strikes that we've been hearing about in the United Kingdom, elsewhere in Europe. Is that on your radar at all, or is that basically just sort of hand-wringing as people have to find something to worry about if they're not eternal optimists like yourself? Yeah, no, you know, anytime you travel to Europe, you have to worry about, you know, strikes. They can happen any day. It's much different here than the U.S. But, uh, you know, in Spain, there will be strikes uh, with Iberia's ground staff around the New Year holiday. Yesterday, we saw the Eurostar have a surprise strike that displaced a lot of people. They're actually not even selling trains today between uh, Paris and London. So, but overall, there might be some German train strikers here or there. But, um, hopefully no widespread strikes that we're aware of. And so how should travelers think about that? Say that they do have a holiday European vacation booked. I mean, should they be thinking about insurance here or how to best handle that? Yeah, so what most people don't realize is when you use your premium travel credit card, as I'm assuming many people watching this program do, whether that's Amex Platinum, Chase Sapphire, Capital One Venture, those cars, cards come with built-in perks. And this is what people don't realize. Um, if you're, my, I was traveling to Puerto Rico in May and my flight was delayed like 10 hours uh, by United for a mechanical reason. United gave me a $100 e-gift card and told me to go away. And, but American Express refunded $500 for me to get a hotel, to get Ubers, to go out to dinner in Old San Juan. So always go to your credit card company for compensation. And when traveling to Europe, there's a rule called EU 261 compensation. And if you're traveling to or from Europe um, and there's a flight delay for pretty much any reason, they are mandated by the government to give you compensation. Um, so yes, go to the airline, but generally the airlines are pretty cheap when it comes to compensation. Your credit card is where it's at. The only time I really recommend travel insurance is if you're going on that mega trip on a big expensive cruise line, safari, you're bringing, uh, you know, people who could get sick abroad where you might need that evacuation coverage. Mm. So, but in general, your credit cards protect you a lot more than you realize. 
Yeah, so maybe uh, you actually should read the fine print uh, there. But what are you actually seeing in terms of where people are going when it comes to this holiday season? Are they going abroad or is much of the travel that you're seeing booked and happening right now within the country? Yeah, I mean, most of the travel growth we're seeing is international. It's funny, I was looking up where are the deals for uh, I was just searching from New York, and the best travel deals were Miami, Orlando. And a year, two years ago, we all knew Miami flights were like $2,000 each, crazy rates. So we've seen some of that demand from domestic travel now. Uh, we're seeing huge increases. United Airlines just started flying nonstop from San Francisco to Christchurch, New Zealand. They're betting big on uh, the Pacific region, new flights to Tahiti. And so I think there are a lot of travelers who now feel comfortable traveling internationally, doing that big trip. Japan, it, I'm going there in February. We're seeing huge increases in, in that type of travel. And also when it comes to lodging, uh, we're seeing a huge increase. Hotels.com saw 125% increase in authentic lodging. So whether that's a Rio can in Japan or staying at a Riyadh in Morocco, I think travelers are sick of paying for overpriced cookie cutter hotels and are willing to shell out for those luxury experiences. Are they looking for discounts or is this still very much the experience world that's just continuing? And is this a, basically a sea change that has legs where experiences will keep seeing people pay up for some of these unique experiences, uh, even if they don't buy a shirt and an outfit uh, that's fancy to accompany it? Yeah, people, you know, funny enough, discounts are happening domestically. JetBlue just ran a $50 off fair sale, Southwest. So uh, the domestic airfare market and those carriers are struggling where the premium cruise lines that are just launching, there's tons of new, really exclusive ships. I just did expedition cruising is huge. I'm seeing more and more of my friends go to Antarctica. Uh, I just went on Swan Hellenic to Greenland, and that was an incredible experience. Um, so, yeah, people are shelling out for unique, bespoke experiences. That sector of the market is cannot grow fast enough. It's and even I mean, domestically, theme park travels big. Disney still can, uh, continues to see growth. And it's not just Disney. Dollywood uh, just increased prices and opened up new parts of their park Mattel. So people really want to take their families, not just to a, a beach vacation, but they want to go and experience the new Mattel theme park that just opened up in Arizona. They really want these unique experiences, and, and that's a trend I can uh, foresee happening more and more. And Brian, you are the points guy, so let's talk about uh, some news that broke this week. It was first reported by Reuters basically about the Department of Transportation in the early stages of looking into airline frequent flyer programs, really checking whether airlines have engaged in unfair or deceptive practices when it comes to some of those programs. What do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's much needed. A lot of times there are changes that happen overnight. And, you know, it can be said that the airlines are banks nowadays. The airlines are making more money selling their currencies of frequent flyer uh, programs to banks. So I do think there needs to be a little bit more consumer heads up, right? If you're going to have this multi billion dollar loyalty program that essentially is a bank where, you know, you're creating your own currency, um, you should give consumers notice when making negative changes. We saw this year Delta and American Express rolled out some uh, pretty punitive changes to their credit cards, increasing fees, et cetera. And there was huge consumer backlash uh, to mostly Delta on that one. And we saw them roll back some of their changes. Now, do I think the government needs to come in and regulate every aspect of loyalty programs? Probably not. But having some more consumer protections when those negative changes happens, I think, are a good thing for everyone involved because people are getting sick of just constantly changing and moving of the goalposts. And waiting in line at the uh, at the lounge. I mean, that Eight might lines. be part of the issue. Yeah, I mean, Brian Kelly, thank you so much for being with us. Brian Kelly of The Points Guy, thank you, uh, as always, as we all envy his life in uh, <laughs> having all these bespoke experiences in Iceland. And Yeah, with his I want to go to Japan. That sounds really nice. He said he was going there in February. Yeah, yeah. you're going to try to join along. You know, I was going to go to uh, the Olympics in Tokyo, and then 
COVID happened, so uh, it didn't work out for me. Never been to Japan. Well, uh, this is something that is sort of indicative of where we're at because a lot of people, I guess, are looking for some of those experiences more. Coming up next, we've got Joe Quinlan on Mer of, of Merrill and Bank of America Private Bank looking toward uh, that key indicator coming out in about 35 minutes time, core PCE, the de core PCE deflator, that indicator that the Fed looks at. The balance of risks right now, and this is something we've been talking about, is it that if we get an upside surprise that raises questions about disinflation or mm -hmm. is it a downside surprise turbocharges people's conviction in the trade that's already been happening. Well, you think about the uh, potential of an upside surprise and the conversation we had with Marvin Lowe uh, at 6 a.m. this morning saying that it's a credibility issue for the Fed, that if they are going to cut, they do not want to hike again. Meanwhile, in markets, we see basically not a lot of activity. Why would we, uh, given the fact that there isn't that much going on and potentially things could be upended in about 35 minutes time? The euro gaining versus the Dara 110, 90 team. really hard to find that person who's very bearish. I think the bullishness is probably has a, has a wider window to, uh, to perform in uh, going into 2024. 24 is going to be a surprisingly good year for the market. I think we're going to feel a little bit pressure on the big caps coming into the new year. The risk is the recession that the market is expecting doesn't happen. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. The Great Hope comes in 30 minutes' time. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Surveillance. This is a Bloomberg Surveillance. Uh, Jonathan Farrow, Tom Keen, Lisa Abramowitz, John and Tom are both off today. Katie Greifeld very much here. We are 30 minutes away from that core PCE data that really is the key inflation metric that the Fed looks at at a time of incredible hope built on this disinflation narrative. Absolutely. And you look at some measures, as uh, Julia Coronado was telling us earlier, if you really torture the data on some measures, we're already back to 2% that Fed's target, of course. Uh, but of course, when it comes to the headline numbers, et cetera, not quite there, but we've come a long way pretty quickly. And yesterday, people were picking up the fact that in the third revision of third quarter GDP, it sounds pretty esoteric. However, within that, we saw the GDP price index actually revised lower at 3.3% versus 3.6%. And core PCE, this was core price PCE, came in quarter over quarter at 2.0%. 2.0% from the expectation of 2.3%. So already hitting that target at a time when people already had this enthusiasm. Could we see more of the same today? Exactly. And how much uh, is the risk that we do see too much of a good thing? Of course, the Fed has been very successful in engineering inflation down a lot more quickly than perhaps they expected, than the markets expected, certainly. Uh, but And then, of course, you think about the bearish case becomes, OK, maybe they get a little bit over their skis here and we do come down much uh, further than we thought. Or it's because of growth concerns, right? And that's the other side of it, which is the reason why people are focusing on Nike coming out overnight, basically saying that they're expecting to take $2 billion of uh, cost cuts and make that through uh, cutting jobs, through cutting other expenses. The latest quarter, they were talking about a 400 to $450 million charge, largely due to severance expenses. You're seeing those shares lower by about 12%, bouncing around. Uh, not a lot of liquidity pre-market, now down 11%. We're seeing a kind of commensurate move in Foot Locker, in Adidas, in Puma, in a whole host of other retailers. And again, this sort of goes to the core of, is there more weakness under the surface that we heard about from the likes of Patrick Harker and that kind of we're hearing other Fed officials nod to as well? And it's interesting in terms of signposting where we are in the cycle, because you think back a year ago, I think it was when you had all those big tech companies cutting jobs and uh, getting rewarded in the stock market. Uh, shareholders really wanted to see that cost cutting discipline when it came to the business. Of course, now we're in a different part where people are worried about that slowdown. And this is just bad news. Not that worried, though, if we talk to Eddie Ardeni, considering <laughs> that he's true. sort of like, yeah, I guess that it doesn't really keep me up at night. I kind of sleep pretty well right 
right now in markets not doing that much. Uh, and why should they? It's been already an incredibly volatile couple of weeks, a couple of months. And what we're seeing right now is a lack of action ahead of a key metric on inflation, 47.96 right now on S&P futures. Euro, uh, 110.23 versus the dollar, crossing that mark to the highest, strongest levels, I should say, going back to July. Ten-year yields, 385. To me, this is just a shocking story of a round trip. And Katie, I love how you put it, basically, pointing to the fact that we're ending the year right where we started it. But it hasn't felt that way. No, not not at all. Again, I feel like the summer felt like a year in and of itself. Of course, that big trip up to 5% that we took on 10-year uh, yields, Cer certainly everyone was worried about the deficit. They were worried about Treasury supply, just the supply of bonds coming to market. And just quietly, all of those fears were quieted. And it comes at a time of some shifting winds from the Treasury Department, from the U.S. government, as well as on uh, the expectation of disinflation. Joining us now, I'm so pleased to say, Joe Quinlan, head of CIO Market Strategy at Merrill and Bank of America Private Bank. Joe, thank you so much for being with us. I want to start with just how much you've changed your view going into 2024 on the heels of the great Fed pivot. Well, Lisa, I mean, I was more constructive on the market before the Fed pivot, and I'm a little concerned talking to our clients about how optimistic they're becoming. So you've seen the great run-up since November. Um, so we're, we're still cautious and constructive on the markets in 2024 for sure, but maybe we pulled forward into 23 some of the gains in 24, but we'll see. We still see a good economy, good earnings, and more upside as we go deeper into next year. What makes you concerned, Joe, considering the fact that we don't necessarily have the risk of the Fed uh, staying overly hawkish for a prolonged period of time, and we don't necessarily have signs that the economy is really slowing down much? Well, Lisa, that, that, latter, that latter point is, is key in terms of the inflation outlook. You know, inflation expectations have come down. Um, but maybe we have an economy that just has a mind of its own, keeps plowing ahead, more consumer spending, keep the unemployment rate under 4%. We could revisit this idea that the Fed is going to pivot and cut and maybe just go back on pause. And that could be a head fake for the market. But in general, this economy continues to surprise on the upside. And that keeps that inflation play out there. And you talked about it earlier. The last mile, the 2%, you know, how adamant is the Fed going to be to get there and how hard is it going to be? I think it's going to be harder than Jay Powell thinks. And Joe, I want to talk about how you position a portfolio against that backdrop, because I'm taking a look at your notes right now, and I see that your sector preference is for energy and it's for healthcare. Of course, two sectors that are in the red this year, of course, energy after two awesome years. You think about double digits gains. Uh, healthcare had a rough year last year as well. When it comes to that preference, is that just as simple as buying the laggards of this market? Uh, not really, Katie, in the sense that, you know, health, you know, healthcare has some value given the pullback. Uh, energy, we like commodities, you know, hard assets, hard power, because, you know, I think something the market is not really, really focused in on is the, the geopolitical risks that are out there, whether it's Europe, the Middle East, Asia, you know, something springs up and we have this bolt out of the blue. You want to be more defensive, more hard assets, U.S. centric. Uh, we're seeing a lot of money come over, come from overseas into the U.S. assets. But so we're playing more defense. But I do think as, as this economy proves resilient on the upside, we're going to lean more into cyclicals as we go deeper into 2024 as well, whether it's industrials, materials, financials. That's going to give a better breadth for the market as we go deeper in, into next year. Well, let's talk about those hard assets a little bit more because, of course, you talk about crude and the conversation has been this incredible non-reaction to all of the geopolitical uh, issues in the world right now. Which specific commodities are you looking at when you say own hard assets? You know, copper, nickel, you know, cobalt, some of these EV, you know, the renewable sector in that sense. Energy, uh, Katie, you nailed it in the sense that, you know, the market response to what's happening in the Middle East has been pretty interesting with the oils. But remember, the U.S., you know, a lot of people don't realize we're the largest oil producer in the world, 13 million barrels a day. That's two and a half times what we did, say, 2005. So, you know, our energy sector is very, very dynamic. It's a global leader. A lot of demand for, for our, our products in Europe and Asia. So we, we think long term, that is a nice place to be. And if we kind of, you get the dividends, you get the share buybacks, and you get the upside and the hedge from any geopolitical risks. 
At this moment, we're talking about a next year uh, that is possibly going to look a lot like the one that some people expected for this year. I am curious about your view on U.S. assets. You do prefer U.S. assets over international ones. As at a time where we're starting to see some weakness in the dollar, does that concern you? Do you think that that's going to be short-lived? Do you think that uh, the dollar is going to strengthen again as you start to see some of the other nations and for the European Union kind of be forced into cutting well, Lisa, you know, when we talk about the dollar, I mean, to me, you know, let it slide a little bit here against the euro or some other major currencies, because it'll be very good, beneficial for the big cap, large cap multinationals here in the United States. So, you know, I'm not really worried about that just now. And, you know, we look very carefully at the emerging markets. I mean, China has had a rough 2023. So does that mean it's better set up for 2024? We'll see. We debate that a lot. In Europe, it's more it's more scattered shot. You want to buy the luxury brand leaders, some of the renewables uh, later down the pipeline, insurance companies, health life life science companies out of Switzerland. But you know, I you know I hate to say this, but like when when it comes to the dy dynamic nature of earnings, growth, innovation, all roads still lead to the U.S. So we mm -hmm. that's our core. When we build por portfolios, that's where we start. That's where our core is, and then we go out. And look at other parts of the international markets and more sector specific and oriel momentum well joe let's stay on the u.s and let's talk about the u.s bond market because lisa and i have been marveling at all morning you take a look at the 10-year treasury yield it has been a round trip in 2023 uh, a rocky one at that how are you thinking about the bond market and the level of 10-year yields right now are we around fair value or is this an overbought market uh, great question, Katie, and it's something we talk a lot about with our clients and internally as well. The round trip has been quite dramatic here. Um, shorter duration, but, you know, that 60-40 por traditional portfolio, that's been more of a conversation as well with clients. But here, when it comes to kind of the bond market or money markets in general, we're starting to see for the first time clients want to get out of the money markets. I mean, they're actually having that conversation, say, hey, we should be more in equities. What, how should we position? So I think one of the key messaging messaging what we're seeing with our clients is like okay we've got this excess cash we want to get back in equities how do we do it so i do think that six trillion in money market funds that's going to be fodder for fixed income and in high quality shorter durations and equities over the balance of 2024. Joe Quinlan of Maryland Bank of America Private Bank, thank you so much for being with us. Happy holidays as you head into the new year. Right now, uh, we're not seeing uh, that much reaction in markets, but to me, this sort of caution around the edges seems interesting. And this is the reason why. If we get a downside surprise, is that going to be more of uh, some kind of impact on markets, downside surprise to the core PCE, rather than an upside surprise in the sense that there isn't enough bullishness. I mean, that sounds crazy, especially coming from someone who tries mm -hmm. to find the skepticism in the, in, in the narrative. But that seems to be something that's just kind of percolating out there. Yeah, there still feels like this skepticism to this rally, even though we have seen the broadening out that a lot of people said that they wanted to see before they really felt good about this market. We've certainly seen that. But then you think about all the money in money market funds, at least a good portion of that is a safety bid. And then you think about gold for example. I mean, uh, gold hit a record high and it feels like no one really talked about it. Uh, that coming just in the past couple of weeks. So there's still a bid for havens out there, even with this big, big rally that we're seeing. No one talked about it because how do you understand gold? Yeah, when do you ever get the narrative right with gold? I'm not talking I about I think it's personally. physical Bitcoin. I mean, how... okay. <laughs> stop. You're trolling half the audience right now. It's like Bitcoin, but shiny, I think. <laughs> if you're just joining the program, the S&P is basically flat uh, right now. We're looking at uh, just below 4,800. 4796. Really, Katie? You're really going to do that? <laughs> Is that basically your 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 pitch for the I, uh, Crypto I'm, Tuesdays? I think I'm more than half joking. Uh, but I, I will say when people started describing Bitcoin as uh, digital gold, it did start to make a little bit more sense uh, why people were so obsessed with it. So, But it know. also took some of the volume away from it. I don't know. I feel like gold is one of those things that the gold bugs kind of wake up every time there's some sort of uh, threat. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So I don't know. I just it's been a really hard one. To 
to really wrap my head around. I think it's, I like to think about the psychology of different asset classes. You know, bond traders, they're classically pessimistic. You know, they're very doom and gloom. That, of course, is the stereotype. But then you think about gold bugs, and uh, it's totally different. You know, then you start to get into some conspiracy theories, and I found that really fun. Yeah, sort of like the Armageddon trade. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right now, uh, one thing that's not the Armageddon trade, I thought this story was interesting. Uh, Tesla's designer came out and said that the cyber truck's design kind of gives it an edge because it makes it kind of funky. I, I was thinking maybe a literal edge because lo it looks like if you uh, sort of brush past it, you might get a scrape or something. Which makes me think that probably if you parked it in New York City on the, on the sidewalk or on the street. Can you I'm drive guessing. it over the bridge? They're so heavy. Have you ever driven one? No, I would love to. I think they're hysterical. Hysterical is maybe not what they're going for. Coming up, I do want to say on Bloomberg Television uh, and radio at 11.40 a.m., don't miss this, a really important conversation. Leo Brainerd, director of the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, joining Bloomberg Television to uh, give her outlook on the economy, on the budget, on inflation, and, of course, some of the latest comments also having to do around U.S. Steel and its acquisition by Nippon. From New York. This is Bloomberg. They are likely to test Western red lines, but they're not going to seek uh, a, a catastrophic response from the coalition. Remember that we now have hundreds of missiles, hundreds of air defense missiles with an extraordinary array of naval capacity around Yemen. But inevitably, the Houthis are going to seek to test uh, our fortitude. That was former senior U.S. intelligence official Norman Rule speaking with us yesterday as we do have this ongoing impasse between Houthi militants that vow to continue uh, attacking container ships and world trade as long as they can in the Red Sea, which uh, does, of course, lead to some key shipping routes that uh, account for 12 percent of global trade. Welcome back. We are looking at markets that are very quiet ahead of uh, a key data indicator core PCE deflator that comes out uh, in about 13 minutes time. S&P futures kind of nudging into the green again, basically unchanged, 47.97 uh, euro versus the dollar, 110.24. Uh, yields lower on the day, and this comes after yesterday's gauge came in softer than expected from the third quarter revision. Uh, rev the third qu third revisions of the third quarter GDP. It sounds sort of esoteric, and yet some people were saying this is the reason why markets moved, and you're seeing oil prices just a bit higher. But to me, honestly, everyone's been talking about the potential headwinds for next year. One of them is what if oil prices go up mm -hmm. in response to the conflict with the uh, Israel and Hamas war, as well as Ukraine-Russia uh, Ukraine war. And then there's this issue now of some of the potential blockages in a key shipping route that doesn't seem to have an easy solution. Absolutely, we're talking about supply chains once again, of course. You would hope that uh, some of these companies, some of these shippers would be better prepared for this, but uh, of course, after what we saw in the pandemic, but still uh, some big, big implications when you think about the state of the flow of goods around the world. So just to get a state of play and understand kind of what the potential risk scenario is and you know how this might get resolved, Nick Wadhams is joining us now. He leads uh, Bloomberg's national security team. Nick, can we just start with the state of play. We've already heard uh, the Houthis vow to continue the attacks. We've learned of a coalition of allies to try to prevent it. What's actually going on on the ground at this moment? Well, in the last 24 hours or so, there has been a real sort of quieting down. We haven't seen uh, uh, any more uh, Houthi strikes against shipping. That's uh, in part, of course, because so many ships have diverted uh, to go around the, the southern tip of Africa. So uh, you know, but the big question is the U.S. is in the process of pulling together this maritime coalition whose whole purpose is to essentially protect uh, ships passing through the Red Sea. And the question is whether that's going to be good enough. Are we going to start to see ships uh, deciding to route back through despite the potential danger from the Houthis? Because, again, though they haven't attacked, they've given no sign that they plan to let up when they see those ships again. So that's really what we're looking for, some statement of confidence or intent that would signal shippers are willing to go back through the Red Sea once again. And so far, that's not happening with hundreds of merchant ships being rerouted uh, away from the Suez Canal into much lengthier uh, passages to avoid this threat. Nick, there was a story in the New York Times that caught my attention about the potential for the U.S. starting to sell arms once again to Riyadh, to Saudi Arabia, and this being a potential kind of you scratch my back, I scratch yours 
members for their assistance in trying to help negotiate with the Houthi militants. Do we have any sense of where the uh, negotiating chips are to get more Middle East partners on board with that? Well, it's a great question. and It's such a complicated dynamic. But essentially, look, I mean, you have a situation where there is a ceasefire, however tentative, between Saudi Arabia and the Houthis in Yemen. So the U.S. may be looking to, to reward Saudi Arabia for the fact that that ceasefire is to some extent holding, saying, OK, we will send you these offensive weapons again, sort of on the condition that you don't really use them against the Houthis at the moment. But certainly, I mean, Saudi Arabia is just so central to all the U.S. plans in the region. I mean, the continued hopes for normalization talks with Israel, obviously, conversations on what happens next in Gaza, efforts to get the Palestinians on board. I mean, they just need Saudi Arabia for basically every major strategic initiative they have in the region. So this is sort of a nice little carrot uh, for the Saudi government saying, listen, we appreciate your support. We're going to need a lot more of it in the months ahead. So here's a little something you can have that you so desperately want. Well, Nick, that's where I wanted to go. You mentioned the importance here of Saudi Arabia. How worried is the administration at this point that this could spill into a broader regional conflict? Well, I mean, that is essentially uh, what they say is their overriding uh, concern. So uh, obviously there's there's the fate of the hostages and, and the civilian casualties and, and the concerns about how Israel prosecutes the war in Gaza. But the bigger fear there really for the U.S. is, OK, how do we keep this thing from spreading? You have Hezbollah in Lebanon. You obviously have the Houthis, both backed by Iran. And the U.S. is very, very concerned that this thing will spread even further. Obviously, Saudi Arabia, again, completely instrumental, essential to U.S. plans to tamp things down. Maybe there are some back-channel conversations that are able to be had with Iran. There's also influence that Saudi Arabia can exert on other players that can in turn influence Iran. So, you know, again, it's just it's it's all part of this U.S. effort to, to keep things relatively calm and, and the, the real feeling is that they are not sure how to do it. Again, you get back to that Houthi issue uh, and the fear that the more Houthi attacks really could pull the U.S. into a broader conflict. Well, Nick, to that point, Bloomberg News reported this week that the U.S. is considering military strikes against Houthi bases. What's the latest there on the idea that maybe the U.S. could shift from just deterrence to actually going on the offense here? Well, what we're going to have to see there is what happens when ships start routing through the Red Sea again and what sort of intelligence the U.S. is gathering about Houthi intentions, because everything that's been done so far has been, as you say, deterrence, defensive. So they're shooting down drones. They're trying to stop the attacks, but they're not hitting the Houthis at the source. They're not going after those drones and ballistic missiles. Uh, in Yemen itself. And obviously doing so would represent a massive escalation and again feed those fears of a broader war. But there is some talk within the administration that, listen, if you want to neutralize this threat to shipping, you can't just play defense. You have to go on the offense. So that that's something they're certainly weighing. Uh, but again, we're really going to have to see what shippers decide and whether they're willing to put ships potentially in harm's way once again now that this coalition is formed. Meanwhile, Nick, especially as we head into an election season, we hear a lot about domestic threats stemming from some of what's going on in the Middle East. I'm thinking about some of the rhetoric that the border issues are deeply related to this because we're at a heightened risk of terrorists coming in through the borders or other types of attacks in the nation. Based on your connections with people in the intelligence community, how much validity is there behind some of those concerns? You know, uh, I mean, the border situation is a great question. My sense is that really they are just in pure, almost panic mode about how to stem the tide of migrants who are coming in from the border. And it's not so much a question of uh, concerns about terrorism. I mean, that is that is a concern that's raised by some people, particularly among Republicans. Democrats in the Biden administration, I think, don't see that quite as much as a major threat. Uh, but they are planning to send the Secretary Blinken to Mexico at some point in the coming days, as President Biden announced yesterday. Uh, they really need to figure something out with Mexico and are finally sort of getting to the point that they realize they, they need to do something about this. Uh, how they are going to be able to achieve that, though, that is the big question. And that's something they just do not have an answer to right now.
Nick Wadhams of Bloomberg, thank you so much. Uh, happy holidays. Have a wonderful new year. This really uh, is the year where we're ending on a massive geopolitical bang in all the wrong ways. And frankly, next year, it seems like that's one of the big questions that's keeping people up at night, not because they can trade around it, but just because of you know, humanity issues. Yeah, yeah. And it's, of course, a tricky moment for the Biden administration. You think about the fact that there's two hot wars going on right now in the world. And then you add what's happening to the Red Sea on top of that, the potential to exacerbate one of those hot wars. And uh, you add in the fact that next year is an election year. There is a lot for Joe Biden to keep an eye on. Especially given the fact that there's a lot of disagreement within his own party and within his own cabinet about how to handle some of these things. Look, it's not easy. We're dealing with two proxy wars, right? Mm -hmm. We're dealing with one uh, proxy war with Iran, one proxy war with Russia. A lot of questions around how much the U.S. wants to get involved, what will potentially ignite an even broader uh, war at a time where there's some very difficult new nuanced stances going on with Middle East partners and enraged kinds of rhetoric around the world. I mean, it really is quite a moment to try to delicately walk. And a delicate dance, too, going on with China, of course, the second largest economy in the world. Of course, 2023, we did see a little bit of movement on that front, normalizing that relationship. But that is top of mind for a lot of uh, citizens and investors as well. But even more important, inflation. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about that PCE, core PCE deflator that's going to be coming out. And we are so pleased to say Michael Gapin of Bank of America is going to be able to help us parse through those numbers and understand the disinflationary hopes and dreams. Are they coming true? are just seconds away from the last important data release of 2023. It is exciting. It is core CP, uh, core PCE deflator. We're going to take a look at the key metric for the Federal Reserve heading into it. Just the setup is pretty quiet as people really have no reason to trade ahead of a key economic data point. What's notable to me today is the lift in crude up about seven tenths of a percent or seven, uh, $74.44. Right now across the terminal, we are getting some of the data trickling in. And, and right now it is showing, wow, that the PCE deflator month over month actually went down. So it declined 0.1% versus the expectation of being flat. That means that year over year, the PCE deflator came in at 2.6% rather than the survey expected 2.8%. And then when you take a look at the uh, core PCE deflator, year over year, you're looking at 3.2% versus the expectation of 3.3%. So a good down side surprise for those who are looking for disinflation. And what you can see is markets like what they see, at least around the margins, not a massive reaction at this point. S&P futures basically unchanged, uh, but really kind of confirming the disinflation uh, that we have been talking about and seeing in all of the other indicators, just taking a look at the two-year yield, uh, you know, not seeing a lot of activity, which maybe gives us a sense, Katie, that this was kind of expected and baked into the pricing going into this. Yeah, perhaps it was priced in. Uh, interesting too to not see, though, too much of a reaction. We'll see how these numbers uh, settle in and the market digests it. But uh, two-year yields look now back to unchanged on the day. I will point out, you take a look at durable goods orders. This is preliminary for November. A big beat there, 5.4% actual. The survey was expecting 2.3%. So certainly a surprise. Uh, you know, you're watching the market try to digest all of this. And I will say that S&P 500 futures moving a touch lower right now. Durable goods orders, you mentioned that. And that I think is one of the key uh, components here. Not only are they almost twice or more than twice the expectation in terms of the uh, magnitude of the increase there. But the prior month was revised upwards. So it was lesser of a negative than originally reported. We're seeing across the board the disinflation, but still economic strength, which really sets us up for this question of can this continue? Where we get this disinflation with ongoing strength. They will just bring you a couple other numbers. Personal income coming in, as expected, 0.4%. And personal spending increasing 0.2%. That's a touch lower than expected of 0.3%. Downward revisions on personal spending for the prior month. But personal income 
<laughs> increased uh, more than expected the prior month. So pretty much people are being responsible. They're not spending too much. Their incomes are increasing. They're ordering more goods, yet inflation is still continuing to come in, Katie. And with all that in mind, it's interesting to not see necessarily a positive reaction to these figures. Again, we're talking about small moves here, but you take a look at futures right now on the S&P 500. We're down a tenth of a percent. Uh, again, very small moves, but we were unchanged heading into this report. Uh, so it's interesting to see these narratives try to get parsed right now. What gives? Let's ask that question to Michael Gapin, head of U.S. economics at Bank of America Securities. Michael, what is your reaction given the fact that markets seem to be a little put off by consistently disinflationary data? I think the markets had, well, first of all, good morning, Lisa and Katie. Um, thanks for having me on. I, I think markets had priced this, this in already with the CPI data in hand and the PPI data in hand. We can make a pretty good projection of where PCE should come in. And we did expect the headline to be down a tenth and the core to only be up a tenth. So this number really wasn't a surprise to us. And if you if you do the implied CPI forecast from market prices, they're they're looking for pretty soft inflation over the next three to six months. So I think that the market had largely priced in this number, as as we all know, they're looking for about twice as many cuts this year as the Fed has has planned. So I think this was a status quo number for markets. That might be status quo. The durable goods orders, as Katie pointed out, not so much. It came in significantly right. higher than expected. And I wonder if on the margins there's some anxiety that it, it seems sort of incompatible that we could get ongoing better than expected growth while still seeing that disinflation that everyone's been hoping for. Yeah, there's certainly a limit to that, right? So, so, so far, the, the narrative is that the economy can cool, growth can remain modest or moderate, um, but away from recession, and we can experience both moderate growth and disinflation at the same time. That's, that's our view. I think that's the Fed's view for sure, um, and why they've shifted to, say, a more balanced reaction function between bringing inflation down and wanting to support a soft landing. But you're right, there's a limit to that. There is a risk to shifting to a dovish stance now and coming out of the December meeting and tilting the outlook towards rate cuts because markets have reacted quite quickly and financial conditions have eased. So the, the risk is that maybe you, you gin things up too much and, and you don't make as much progress as you want on the inflation front. So um, no free lunch in, in that regard. We think the Fed's in a good spot. We do think rate cuts are, are coming, but you, you make a good point. Too, too much easing, too much easing in financial conditions could ultimately mean Inflation is stickier to come down or maybe even rises a little bit and kind of puts off some of these rate cuts that the market is expecting. Well, let's talk about just the magnitude of the rate cuts that the market is expecting. Of course, 150 basis points priced into next year. A big gulf between that and what we saw in the dot plot, just 75 basis points of cuts penciled. And when you take in totality what we learned today when it comes, of course, to PCE, to personal income, to spending, and of course, uh, those durable goods orders, where does this land in terms of what the market is expecting? Do those six uh, rate cuts look justified at this juncture? I, I think the inflation data certainly support the idea that the Fed can start in, in March. So uh, assuming the data flow trends in the way that it has with, with a lot of evidence of disinflation and modest growth, but a cooling economy, we do think rate cuts can start in March a little earlier than the Fed thinks. We would say you know, curb your enthusiasm a bit for 150 or maybe more rate cuts over the course of, of the year, because <clears throat> we do think inflation will be a little more slower to come down. So we agree on the start earlier than, than later, but our view is you get about 100 basis points of cuts. So the market may need to reprice some of these as the data comes in. So, okay, maybe that process back to target will be slower than expected. Compare that to what we heard from Jerome Powell last week. He said that he was reluctant to say that the last mile of this inflation fight will be more difficult. Is that your expectation or does slower than expected uh, sort of imply there's some pain ahead? No, I, I, would, I would agree that at least, the, you know, again, the composition of the data flow that we've been seeing I think suggests we can enjoy modest growth and disinflation. And it does suggest that the last mile may not be overly difficult, right? So that, that does come from supply side effects, both on goods and on services where reemployment has, has really helped uh, increase services output. So we're getting a supply side effect there. As everyone knows, core goods have been falling for six months. 
So we'll see if things like shipping issues out of the Red Sea change that narrative. But otherwise, the, the last three to six months worth of data suggests maybe we can, you know, it's more likely than not that we can get down to 2% consistent outcomes without needing to generate significant pain in labor markets, which well, would be a great outcome for the Fed, the, you know, the average U.S. household and the average U.S. business. It's, it would be a great outcome for the economy. Well, I want to talk about that a little bit more because inflation has been en enemy number one from the Fed's perspective for really the last couple years now. But now as we continue to get this march lower when it comes to some of these uh, figures, does the Fed's focus shift here? Do they start paying more attention to economic growth, to the labor market, et cetera? Yeah, I still think inflation, bringing inflation down is the number one goal, given where inflation's been, where it is, and, you know, the, the Fed's internal consistency about, hey, we really control inflation. We set that long-run inflation objective. We determine long-run inflation outcomes. So that's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's in their blood, so to speak, and in their DNA. So I still think that's, you know, issue number one. But a very close issue number two, if not closer to balanced, is, hey, I think we can soft land this economy. We don't need to generate as much pain in labor markets as we thought we might have had to do six to nine months ago. So we should keep an eye out uh, for that. So yes, it, it does make an argument that one of the reasons why the market has so many cuts priced in is both of, the, both of those cases, moving to a more balanced reaction function in an environment where the economy is cooling and inflation is slowing, that just increases the odds you're likely to get rate cuts. So I think the market is listening to that message. Michael, what's the gap between uh, just weakening that is good and weakening that is bad? And I ask this because I'm trying to still understand the uh, language out of the CFO's office at Nike when they said that demand is cooling faster than they expected, revised downwards some of their expectations for sales, talked about cutting jobs. Is this something that is just an idiosyncratic business overlaid with a weakening economy in a good sense, or is this potentially something bad? Yeah, I, th I think I would put that narrative probably inside the, you know, the rotation story away from goods purchases back to services. The good side of the economy, the manufacturing sector has been kind of on the edge, if not in a mild recession for some time now, um, at least in terms of, you know, production and inventory adjustment and so forth. So I think the good side of the economy is, is reacting in part to that rotation story. Um, what still looks pretty solid is, is activity and employment on the services side of the ledger, which is you know two thirds or more of, of output. So I think the you know the to, to use your phrasing, the quote good slowing and cooling uh, is about the rotation story, the end of the COVID reopening impulse. Things should naturally slow down anyway. We need to provide an environment for the economy to do that while we bring inflation down without tamping on the brakes too hard. So you're right. There's a fine line between slowing that we think should happen as a result of a very unusual pandemic driven cycle and oops we've got the monetary policy setting calibrated incorrectly it's too tight we have to back out of it more quickly does anything about the services inflation concern you given the fact that it still is running above what you would expect for two percent consistent inflation yeah certainly shelter and kind of the structural issues in the in the housing market without a lot of supply and inventory and available homes to uh, to contract for sale or purchase. Uh, so the shelter story, shelter is moderating. It is coming down, but it's coming down more slowly than our models would have suggested. So we think that there's stickiness there. And even non-shelter services inflation has, has been more sticky. So this is where we would say, maybe, you know, curb your enthusiasm. We have inflation for PCE coming down to around two and a half year on year by the end of this year, uh, where market implied pricing is closer to two. So it's easy to see how a, a, a stickier inflation path could mean some of these rate cuts are not realized. Michael Gapin of Bank of America Securities. Happy holidays. Thank you so much for being on with us. Right now we're looking at markets trying to figure out exactly how to respond to a downside surprise when it comes to inflation coming in less inflationary, more disinflationary than expected, kind of range bound, bouncing around between gains and losses. But right now uh, to the upside, 4802 on the S&P. If you are just joining the program up about a tenth of a percent.
And I've got to say, uh, Katie, what, what we just heard there from Michael Gapin is kind of what Andrew uh, Hollenhorst over at Citigroup is talking about. He just put out a note saying that right now the slowing is largely due to goods. Services inflation and wage growth are running faster than what is consistent with 2 percent inflation. December core PCE will likely be much stronger, but Fed officials will likely still proceed with their plans to cut interest rates. So this is kind of the debate. Are there certain factors that are going to kind of roll over mm -hmm. as the year progresses next year? It's a great question, of course, one we're going to be grappling with uh, for quite a while. I will say it is poetic that you take a look at two-year Treasury yields right now. They are unchanged on the day, totally flat. And that sort of gets back to the point that uh, Michael Gapin was just making, that this was a pretty status quo number overall. Of course, you toggle with some of the details there. But overall, uh, this is consistent with what's already been priced in. And this has been a lot of disinflationary hope. And this sort of raises the question, again, of whether people have priced in that hope entirely into markets uh, across the board, including stocks, where you have seen an incredible rally over the past couple of months, some of the biggest gains that we've seen uh, going back years. What I'm hearing from Neil Dutta over at Renaissance Macro is something that I'm also hearing from Robert Cinch, which is core inflation right now, if you annualize the past six months, is below 2 percent. So this is what people are looking at. Uh, Robert Cinch pointing out that core PCE annualized for the last six months is now 1.87 percent. There you go. Maybe we'll get back to worrying about the fact that uh, inflation's too low. That would be very 2018, very 2019 of us. Yeah, that would be a throwback, wouldn't it? <laughs> I think that that would be uh, quite a moment. Right now, we're not thinking about that as much as uh, just getting to the end of the year uh, and figuring out exactly how to reset for next one. Coming up, Adam Pickett of Citigroup on his 12 trades of Christmas. This is Bloomberg. The Fed is going to need to see uh, at least two or three months more of continued improvement. They're going to need to see sustained improvement before they're going to will be willing to take more action. And, uh, and so I, I think the market should expect that it's going to take a while and more sustained improvement before the Fed does something. That's not at all what markets are currently expecting. That was Robert Kaplan, former Dallas Fed president. But right now, people are very much banking on a March rate cut after a disinflationary data comes out, one uh, no, data point after another. Right now, we are firmly pricing in a 77 percent uh, chance of a rate cut coming at uh, the next meeting that comes in March. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, right now in markets, you can't really see much action. I guess it's all priced in. It's all priced in the S&P 500. Uh, when it comes to futures, at least getting a little bit of a lift there, up about two tenths of a percent. Not a huge reaction, though, when you consider that this was pretty good news. But, you know, to your point, maybe it was all priced in. What we did see, if you are just joining the program and missed it, uh, we did see a personal income come in bang in line with expectations, personal spending a touch below. But this really was the main uh, the main course we saw a negative 0.1 percent decline uh, month over month in PCE deflator and the core deflator year over year came in at 3.2 percent versus the expectation of 3.3 percent do want to just run through a couple stocks that we've been talking about all morning because I think it is important to note it's not that we're, we're seeing no weakness it's just that it's been isolated in specific sectors that have been rolling through sessions Nike shares lower by 11 and a half percent after coming out and saying that they are planning to cut costs by two billion dollars uh, in the face of weaker demand than expected talking about job cuts talking about other expenses uh, that they hope to slash other companies Foot Locker and Dick's Sporting Goods among those in the U.S. Uh, you also see Puma and Adidas over in Europe all falling in tandem and this real question of okay we've already seen the retail recession is it ongoing are we recovering is it China is it global is it the U.S. these are some of the questions that people are trying to parse through away from just some of the euphoria. And you think about the ripple effects of, OK, maybe Nike has some idiosyncratic issues that are specific to Nike. But then you think about a Foot Locker, for example. It relies on Nike for a lot of its revenue. It sells a lot of Nike products, for example. Uh, so again, one chain's problems has widespread effects. Especially because they talked about also uh, just 
maybe paring back some of their models. I thought that was and, interesting. And, you know, having a scarcity kind of uh, situation to ignite some of the interest. Igniting interest is very much had a position for a year that promises to be tumultuous and that we've already seen a lot of one-sided buying. Joining us now, Adam Pickett, head of global macro strategy at City, who is feeling very Christmassy with his 12 trades of Christmas. Adam, how did you come up with certain pairs heading into the new year at a time where markets have moved very quickly and all in one direction? direction? It's a great question. I, I think for me, you know, one of the, the key themes that maybe is going to take us out of that some of big directionality that you talked about is thinking about where some of the divergences are really going to, to come in. Um, obviously, we've had a bit of a one way move in, in risk and duration. But for us, trying to think about picking certain spots within the central bank stories is, is quite interesting. Um, you know, for us, looking at places like Australia on the more hawkish side and pairing that up against maybe the UK on the most other side, where we think, you know, Sterling Aussie is a pretty good story. Noki Stocky within the Scandinavian central banks is a, is a good bull case as well. Um, and we also saw some very diverging guidance from the SNB versus the Bank of Japan, where, again, medium term, we think that uh, buying Swiss versus yen also makes a heck of a lot of sense. Um, given some of the guidance there. So if you don't want to be too directional, um, we think that's a good place to start. But obviously, we've got a, a lot of interesting stories going on with the U.S. and the Fed as well. And is through the FX market really the way to play that idea, this divergence that you're seeing in different uh, developed markets, central banks versus, say, their bond markets? We think so. We think you know there's additional stories um, around, say, the oil dynamics in Norway, um, in the Swiss versus yen. Actually, a big part of the story for the Swissy is that really the SNB's influence on the currency has got nothing to do with rates. It's got entirely to do with the uh, FX intervention story that is going on. Meanwhile, for the yen, it's a little bit of a BOJ story, but obviously it's got a very high beta to US 10 year Treasury yields, which again, we think medium term, there's a story there. So with that, um, we think there's, there are other influences that additionally help the central bank divergence story. You know, gold is another nice one for, for the Fed um, that take you away from the, the pure rate dynamics and a little bit less priced in, we think, too. Well, let's uh, bring this conversation to the U.S. and to the U.S. equity market, because looking at your uh, 12 trades of Christmas, I'm taking a look at trade number one, and that is sort of playing a expected slowdown in the U.S. consumer. What's the best way to do that? I mean, for us, you know, one way we think is, is maybe uh, a useful way to kind of insulate yourself from the, the broad uh, beta is to think about these kind of high quality names, still thinking with a little bit of a, a growth uh, tilt. Uh, ultimately, these guys still have very, very high quality balance sheets, uh, very high cash to debt ratios and pairing that up against some of, some of the smaller firms. Um, so, you know, even though there's a, maybe a bit of a lean towards the U.S. consumer slowing down, Ultimately, we think U.S. household wealth is exceptionally elevated. It's up around 35 to 40 percent, depending on how you look at it, uh, versus 2019. And that still skews, we think, towards consumer discretionary, which has this nice mix of growth, uh, but also uh, sort of top line um, high level spending power versus, say, the Russell. Uh, that can be the best way to, to play that theme of, you know, ultimately, we still have strong uh, spending numbers, as we saw today. Uh, but some of these lower quality firms uh, are still going to be caught up in the credit cycle and the ultimate uh, longer term slowdown. Adam, I do want to point out that you are definitely multicultural. You were talking about it's the 12 trades of Christmas, but you could have come up with a more succinct piece. Uh, the eight trades of Hanukkah, although that's passed. Adam, I am curious if this is a good time to be trading in markets that are uh, of thin liquidity where a lot of people have already got home. Yeah, look, I mean, we, we, we sort of joke that a lot of the year ahead forecasts are stopped out by the end of, of January. I think for a lot of people, their year ahead moves have, have already happened, you know, in the space of a few weeks. You know, for us, one of the themes that can potentially still run um, in a popular trade is something like the steepener in, in the U.S., but we like 530s quite a lot. Um, twos has already moved a lot. Um, the twos tens profile actually is, is quite punitive carry. For us, something like 530s in the medium term still has further to go. The sharp ratio of getting into that kind of trade six months before the first Fed cut um, is about as good as the 210s, uh, but we still think it has a lot of legs. So exactly to your point, a lot of markets have moved, liquidity is thin. I think you know, being patient, being creative with the construct 
of the trade still makes uh, a lot of sense here. Are more people in the office this year, given how much volatility there has been? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I've got a, a good friend of mine who will be in on, uh, on Boxing Day and I think will be far more staffed over the Christmas period than is normally the case. Um, a lot of money to be made and, and probably one of the most active ends of the year that we've seen in a long time. Um, so definitely a lot of interest still. Adam Pickett, thank you so much uh, and happy holidays uh, with your trades. Good luck. Adam Pickett there of City. Interesting to hear that there are going to be a lot more people in the office at a time where we've become accustomed to pretty incredible volatility. I know you're smiling because you're off next week. You're out of here. <laughs> yeah, I am. But I've enjoyed this so much. That's yeah. the reason why. Thank you for being with us. Are you here next week? I am here next week. Going to be uh, working till the bitter end. Uh, of course, I'm going to be doing my best uh, Lisa, Tom, or John impression. We'll oh, three at the same all time three at the same time i don't know maybe i'll switch every hour we'll see what happens like a skinny bow tie uh or like a skinny tie a bow tie yeah what should and i wear for you maybe like a nice blazer no just sort of you know a sky is falling sign you know and just sort of march around you know but what if you know and <laughs> you can make it work honestly it's been quite a year and uh i will say that it's been really front loaded what he just said there uh adam pickett about the idea that the beginning of next year has already been front loaded and brought to this year which kind mm. of sets up some interesting potential uh, moves heading into the last the very, very bitter end, as you yeah. put it. And I mean, you think about uh, all the things that were projected for 2023 and the things that we spend a lot of time talking about right now that we weren't this time last year to bring it back to the equity market. Of course, AI has been the thing to talk about. Weight loss drugs have been the thing to talk about. Uh, maybe I was behind the ball, but those weren't necessarily on my radar last December. Right. So what, we're, what are we going to be talking about next year? I shudder to think. Exactly. Indeed. Right now in markets, uh, not a lot of action. Uh, very important data point, but what it did was just confirm what markets already had been pricing as people parse through it. A little bit more of a lift, 48.07 on S&P, up to tenths of a percent. The euro gaining versus the dollar, 110.28, the highest levels that we've seen going back to July. A little bit less of a bid into Treasuries, 10-year yields at 3.87 percent. Coming up on Bloomberg TV and radio, do not miss this, uh, a conversation with the lead economic advisor to the president at 11.40 a.m., Lael Brainerd, director of the Council of Economic Advisors, at a time of incredible question around why people are feeling so bad if the economy is on a good trajectory. This is Bloomberg.